Welcome to another edition of your Wednesday Night Sports Delight, the platform sports talk show. This is subscribe. Right. I'm down on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Presented from the Boondocks. What up, Joe Bo? Hello, what's up? Happy with what the day. up? Happy you rapping her uh hey sister soldier look right now. Everybody give it up for oh, Bunny. What's happening, Bunny? What's up? Happy home day. T Bone, what's going on, brother? I'm back and I don't know about better than ever, but I'm back. <laughs> what is going on, party people? It is your Wednesday night sports delight, the platform sports talk show. I am your boy Smooth. <laughs> I think that may be on a highlight reel tape. <laughs> better and be glad that you are tuning in live along with the millions and millions <laughs> of the platform sports talk show fans on once again your Wednesday night sports delight. Really? Or really? Brain's truck backing up in his driveway with ninety-seven go. million. There you go. All you hear is this. Probably somebody who's doing something to give back and, and letting the next generation. Say straight. Have me tear up on here. <laughs> Come on now, don't have me tear up. You know I get emotional. <laughs> People watching around the world, no pressure. And we already have our favorite fan, Ms. Williams, saying welcome, Brandon. How, how are you? Hi, Ms. Williams. Uh, a guy who tried to give it his all and put on for the city, to be truthful, because like I said, I'm, I'm St. Louis die hard. The views are smooth, does not reflect the platform sports talk show or its sponsors.
What is happening, everybody? It is your Wednesday night sports delight, the platform sports talk show. I am the one, the only, your boy Smooth with three O's. Can't no one do it like me, baby. How you doing? Welcome to the platform sports talk show. Almost six years running cons- consistently every Every Wednesday, y'all bringing y'all nothing but the hits, nothing but the hits, nothing but the M F and hits. What's going on once again, y'all? Thanks for tuning in right now. If it's your first time watching, thank you very much. Enjoy this experience for the next two hours, maybe two and a half, because it's going to be some of the best sports talk you will experience on a Wednesday night. And I am not alone. She is representing from the Boondocks. She wasn't here last week, but she's back and she's ready because baseball season is officially here after this past Sunday. And she is now live with us. Joe Bo, what is going on with you? Well, so I was trying to look for a bat down here or something. <laughs> I'm, I'm so ready. I'm so ready. Seeing all these pictures and videos of yeah, nice. just these guys walking into a building with flip-flops on is getting me excited so um but yeah it's it's here finally and i'm just i'm ready to get rolling and wbc's right around the corner bought some opening day tickets today so it's i'm excited i'm excited for you and yeah so it's like for me i've been going to like opening games uh, opening day games for the last couple of years but now the me uh, the wifey now shouts out to you Jamie, love you. Jayance, you know, had her V day and everything. We had our V day. It was, it was lovely. Talk about that later on, though. But uh, yeah, so it's like a mission now. Like every year, it's, it's a tradition for us. Got to go to opening day. Last year, when we went, we did like the ballpark village opening day thing. It was okay. But she's used to going to uh out in the Kenner Plaza area where they had like dirty mugs to ban there and other stuff and it'd be like a whole lit you know fest out there for like hours prior to the game so this year I'm making my point that we get there of course super early and enjoy all the vibes get all revved up and ready you know of course until we get to uh Bush Stadium so I'm excited for you uh you know for y'all check out opening day together you uh baby Bova and, and Brendan yeah, we've we've done an opening day when shoot early on. Um, but that that was a long time ago. Like I can't even remember what it was. Uh, but uh, but it was just me and Brendan. So now I'm excited that uh, baby Boba gets to come with us. And like I was saying in the chat, we can get her in free at ball games for this summer and next summer. So we gotta take advantage of it while we can. Yeah, that's so what I did with baby girl when she was young. I'm like, oh, come on, you're going to be on right on my back or on my chest. We're getting <laughs> this love for free. <laughs> we ain't mm-hmm. playing. Yep. Up, up next, this man is in Orlando, Florida, but he'll be back in the loop tomorrow. But, you know, he's doing this thing. He wasn't here last week either, so I was kind of lonely without my peoples. But it's all good. They back. T-Bone, what's happening? Woo, it's been a, it's been a week. It's been a week. What's up, y'all? Hey, I'm looking forward to this this Cardinal season too, because uh my my new place of employment is gonna be about four blocks away from Bush Stadium. So, you know, hey, I'm uh I'm expecting to to see those big crowds. Hopefully I don't have to deal with the traffic. But uh yeah, yeah. What's everybody else up to? That was one of my favorite things of going to the office. My only favorite thing was driving past Bush Stadium every day. So, <laughs> but yeah, it's exciting though. You get to be here for a full summer, I guess, of Cardinals baseball. And and trust me, just like you, I'm gonna use that first half of the season. Me and RJ are gonna be getting some games in right be, right up to the border when he turns four. Right right up to the line. There it yep. is. Loving it, man. Loving it. Once again, for those who are tuning in, let's keep it going. Get them likes, get them shares going because we have a great show in store. Another great guest is in the midst. He'll be on at the 8 o'clock hour, 8 o'clock Central Standard Time, no matter where y'all at. Once y'all know what's happening. But before we go any further, T-Bone, let people know where they can find us at and all them different internets and all that good stuff. 
Ooh, hopefully I'm not too rusty with this, but I mean, look, hey, look, y'all listening to us right now. Hopefully some of y'all are watching this on YouTube. And uh, if you are, hey, look, we're trying to grow this channel so that we can be seen by more people and get more special guests and get more, you know, bring more St. Louis to us. So look, if y'all can do us a favor out there, just go ahead and hit that uh, subscribe button right now. Go ahead and like, go ahead and subscribe. Uh, make sure that you hit that bell so you, you know, when uh, we go live, how does it go again? When we go live, you will be, um, uh, what is it? Notified. Notified. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's it. That's it. See, I'm I'm, I'm, kick, I'm kick, picking it up. All right. So, hey, look, some of y'all might out there want to watch us and see us in HD. I mean, my lighting's not that good today, so I don't know how that's going to work out. But, look, y'all can see us on Roku. And if you just want to purely listen and hear the melodic tones of our voices, you can listen on Hot 365 Radio. That's right, because it's always hot. Hot365radio.com and hey, 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 they got Twitch. They got a Twitch channel. You can catch us on their Twitch channel too. I think that's twitch.tv slash hot365radio. Is it dot com? Is that is no, that the no just hot365radio? Hot See, look, I'm still learning, still learning. This is how we I got you. It's hot three, twitch.tv slash hot365radio. So, look. You know, when you check us out, on whether it's on Twitch, whether it's on YouTube, whether it's on Roku, look, you'll be able to catch what you see right now, the Platform Sports Talk Show. And on the first Wednesday of the month, we have Ladies Night. That's right. You'll be able to catch the crew of ladies out there giving the female sports point of view. Be hit, get to hear all the opinions. Um, You know, they they all got a diverse set of opinions. Bunny out there. She she was talking about my 49ers the other day. I ain't forget, Bunny. I ain't forget. <laughs> Look, I listen. I listen, all right? You know? And uh, hey, that's all right because at the end of the month, we've got the man cave. That's right. The last Wednesday of every month, we got the man cave. So you'll be able to catch all of me and all the fellas out here as we give the male point of view as if we don't get that all the time. So look, hey. There's a lot of opinions out there, and I know that there's a fellow probably hanging around somewhere who's ready to give me a mouthful of his opinion at some point today. So, uh, look, you'll be able to get a little preview of what the man cave normally sounds like. That's right, the last Wednesday of every month, and I think that concludes what we have for the Platform Sports Talk Show package. Hey, that's right. Once we start charging, it's going to be the Platform Sports Talk Show package. Right. And just want to add on, I want to give everyone a challenge who's watching right now. If there is someone that you know, at lead coach, whoever has a incredible sports story to tell the options are right now on your screen. You can at them. OK, at this person. You don't care. It doesn't matter if it's uh, LeBron James or if it's a local coach here in St. Louis or no matter where you are at, at that person and tell them you will be a great guest on the platform of sports talk show. You can also, like what T-Bone said, give us an email, you know what I'm saying, and let us know, hey, reach out to this guy. I have a guy who want to do this, or I have a lady who wants to be on the Ladies Night Show. Whatever it is, just add us either on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, or give us the email, like what T-Bone said earlier, because we want to have these stories told like we will have this evening. So we have a busy, busy show. Let's get things rolling. So normally, y'all know I start off with, hmm, what sports story or stories has your attention? But since yesterday was Valentine's Day and the people on your screen right now, we're all married. So I got to go ahead and do this. Hmm. How was your Valentine's Day? Joe, you up first. Uh, Here, hold on. Oh, hey. <laughs> it was good. Um, we, we usually do the same thing every year is, you know, we make spaghetti and we um, we make chocolate covered strawberries at home together. And so, yeah, that was nice. You know, having Mia there with us again, got her some gifts. She's got these. She loves monkeys right now. So um, Brennan got her this like mama monkey stuffed animal and it comes with baby stuffed animals and. She's been playing with that the last two days now, but it's nice. We don't do anything too crazy. Um, just stay at home, watch a movie, and yeah. But we we had a great time. See you, Bob. How about yourself? Well, Valentine's Day has not officially happened for me yet, as I was on a flight to Orlando yesterday. So uh, Valentine's Day will come on Saturday. So 
Well, where it was a little postponed, a little rain delay, if you will. Hmm. So, so basically, you uh telling the wife uh to, to be ready <laughs> for the weekend. <laughs> 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 T bone like this. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. I like it. And uh for myself, man, Valentine's Day was awesome. Uh the wifey, she gave me a beautiful uh card, kind of snuck it in on me. I'm like, oh, look at you doing it, doing it up with the card and everything. You know, I always had a little tear in the eye. Then uh, you know, I surprised her with uh some flowers, some roses. Uh she was blown away by that. Uh, we went to a comedy show last night over at formerly the uh, Rusty Goat, but now it's called a uh, HG Eatery slash Latte Lounge. Uh, shouts out to St. Louis's own Darius Bradford, comedian. He had his Darius Bradford experience last night and had a live band. Uh, the lead singer's name was Dakota. And when I say this dude here was like, you talking about he had so much soul. Uh, he held things down. It was an incredible experience. Just uh, a nice day of love and just letting love win like we do every day. And we all know that, you know, yesterday just isn't Valentine's Day. Every day, you know, when you're happy, when you're in love, is is Valentine's Day. So shouts out to the wifey. Shouts out to my mom who's probably watching. Shouts out to baby girl. And to, uh, once again, to all the ladies from the Ladies Night panel and to the world. Hope y'all had a wonderful ladies. I'm sorry, ladies night. I had a wonderful Valentine's Day. As I know that the Saunders definitely did, and we appreciate all the love y'all showing us on social media, and you know, keep on getting better and better yeah. and better. Y'all so, were looking good last night. Man, we were doing it up like, oh, let's go. <laughs> yeah. well, no, you know, shouts out also. I had to say this, uh, wifey, uh, she decided to go the keto route, and she's been. You know, putting it in, you know, what I'm saying, uh, doing the fasting, doing certain hours of, of the day and evening, uh, staying strict. And I'm making sure that on my end, as her husband, as, as her protector, as her everything, that I'm making sure that she stays on schedule with everything. And like she posted yesterday that she has lost since the new year about 14 pounds and she's she's on a mission. So I'm proud of her. And we're gonna make sure we keep it going because the, the the happier she is and healthier she is, the better it's gonna be for us. So uh it's, it's what it's what matters, you know what I'm saying? Happy wife, happy life. So uh once again, congrats to you, wifey, and to all those who's putting in that work right now. Keep doing it, keep pushing yourself, don't limit yourself, look at the goal ahead, reach that goal, and then find another goal to do and maximize that as well. So Shouts out to everyone who's putting in their work right now. So, of course, something big happened this past Sunday, the Super Bowl. But before we can begin, T-Bone kind of hinted that he may have someone here who may have a few words to say. Because, uh, T-Bone, you wasn't here last week. And I know it's been a few weeks now since your team lost. And, you know, in the chat, people were getting at you, dog. <laughs> <laughs> and I know it was spearheaded by this man right here. Sadal, <laughs> what's going on with you? How's it going? It hey, was a glorious <laughs> day. I, you know, I enjoyed the Super Bowl. Yeah, yeah. This is this is really uh, been a, a a fun and exciting a playoff uh, series. Uh, and uh, man, man, a lot to talk about. Man, how about that Super Bowl, man? How about this Super Bowl? <laughs> it was good. Yeah. It was a good game. Great game. Great game. Great game. Yes, it was. And real quick, shouts out to our favorite fan, Miss Dub. She says, hi, Fred. Hi, Joe. Hi, T-Bone. Of hey. course, I was on as well. Uh, and to the lady in my life. What's going on, wifey? She said, thanks, coach. Hey. <laughs> And she says, hey, T-Bone and Joe. And, of course, they're going to come in with Sadal in about the next five seconds. So, shouts out to everyone who's tuned in right now. Get them likes. Get them shares going. Let's get more people tuned in. We have another special show. So, going back, the Kansas City Chiefs defeated the Philadelphia Eagles. It was a great game. 
I was going for the Eagles because I feel like they have the better overall team. Uh, the white feed was going with the Chiefs. Uh, Sadal, he didn't want to pick a side. Uh, Joe, I wasn't uh, who you uh, go for, Joe, in Super Bowl, the Chiefs or the Eagles? Uh, the Eagles, just because I don't like the Chiefs, okay. but I figured and, the Chiefs were going to win regardless. And T Bone's going for the for the 49ers, so we, we understand. Uh, I, I, when it came to the game, <laughs> I picked the Chiefs. <laughs> There we go. The wifey says, hey, Sadal. And the wifey says, let's go, Chiefs. <laughs> so, uh, what was your, uh, Joe, I want to ask you first, because I have a feeling you may say you have a little thought about the game and how it ended, especially how the, uh, the game against the, the Chiefs and the Bengals, how that game ended kind of suspect. And I kind of got a vibe off your kind of post on social media that you felt like it was kind of a weird way of how the Chiefs won that game Sunday. But give us your thoughts about the game and uh, the outcome. Um, the game as a whole was a good game, I thought. You know, it was good, close. Um, the first half there, I thought it was going to be super high scoring. <laughs> um, but, no, I mean, what you're referring to, I don't know, it's just weird that there's two games where the Chiefs, they just get a good late call for them. So, I don't know. But the guy that – held or whatever he said he he held him so you know he's not upset about it. i'm not sure he's upset about it but he knows what he did wrong but um i just don't like the chiefs i hate travis kelsey he's cocky and i can't stand him and uh but yeah <laughs> <laughs> and he uh, he acts like it's the world against the chiefs which just about everyone in the world constantly says chiefs have the best quarterback in the league and they're, they're still good, so I don't, I don't understand why he likes going that route, and he's just annoying. So, um, But I'm happy for his mom because she was going to win regardless. <laughs> and Ri- Riri did good. I love Riri. She was amazing. And I'm happy I got to see a good Flash uh, trailer. Th- that's my complete thoughts of the Super Bowl. Yeah, that was pretty cool to see Michael Keaton is back as as Batman. I'm like, whoa. Okay, I'm about to check this out myself. It's going to be amazing. Um if there's any comic book nerds that watch our show, it's based off a of Flashpoint comic book, and it's a good storyline. So, regardless of the actor who's playing the Flash, I think you should go see it because it's gonna have some, uh, you know, some oldies in there, like Michael Keaton hearing that old school Batman music in the background gave me mm-hmm. chill bumps, and I'm gonna be there opening night. Nice, nice, nice. Uh, T Bone, your thoughts? You know, I I thought the game was was pretty good. Um... You know, I I, I kind of question some thing about the some things about the Eagles. You know, the the defense there, in a way, uh, maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm a little biased because of what happened a couple weeks ago. But it seemed like they pretty much tried to target trying to take out uh, Mahomes. You know, mm. they it seemed like they tried to target the ankle when they were leading to the half. But uh, maybe I'm a little biased, right? Maybe maybe I'm just being a little nitpicky. But I will say. That and I wish I would have put it in this chat so y'all could have seen it in real time because I was in a different chat when I was saying it during the game. The Eagles completely blew that game. That that call, that's not look. Every, when people bring up that call that the referee did, that's on the Eagles. And you know why? The reason why is because at the point where Kansas City had the ball at the end, um, the Eagles should have let them score the first time they had the ball. Right when they were around that two minute mark, the Eagles should have went ahead and let them score at that point because I knew. And if you've been watching football for the past so many years, especially with Tom Brady and all of them, you knew it was a high probability they were either going to kick a field goal at that time or they were going to get a touchdown. Either right. one of them would have put Philly behind significantly. It would have been in their best interest to go ahead, let them score. And then with your offense, because the offense didn't have a bad game overall. They tr- could have tried to run down the field and either tie, you know, rather kicking a field goal or getting a touchdown themselves. But there was no good outcome that was going to come from, you know, trying to stop them from scoring when they had two timeouts and under two minutes. They should just, you know, let them score. And as we saw, uh, a call happen, which you would expect them to try to get a call at that point. It always happens. Some type of pass interference or holding or something like that. It's common at that point. So it would have made sense for them just to, 
not even risk making those type of mistakes and just go ahead and use your offense to try to get down the field to tie the game and go into overtime. That's just me. So before I get to Sadal, I have to say, uh, first, I'll shout out to my fam, uh, Eddie and Carmen Gamble, for their hospitality this past Sunday at the Gamble's house. Incredible experience. So watching the Super Bowl, there was a first Super Bowl party since, I believe, 2020, uh, 21 or 20. So it was great. I had a real, it was a wonderful experience. So with that being said, I was trolling everyone all game, <laughs> going back and forth with Chiefs fans. But, you know, I just want to have fun with it, you know, bring, bring some life to it, you know. So I, I had my moments and everything. But once again, the Chiefs won. I was saying at the end, in regards to that call, how the refs were cheating. Uh, I mean, like I said, I was trolling. Yes, it was a penalty. Um, it was unfortunate that it happened at that moment. But that was not the reason why the Eagles lost that game, as T-Bone was saying. Uh, of course, with that big fumble by Jalen Hurts, that was a game changer. Because if he didn't fumble that ball during that time frame, it's possible the Eagles could have had maybe a two-touchdown lead before halftime. But that fumble changed everything. So the Eagles had other opportunities to make things happen and to be up at least two scores over the Chiefs, and they did not do that. But overall, yes, uh, Miss Williams or Miss Dub, it was a great, great game. A lot of action in regards to scoring. Uh, both teams went back and forth with it. That's what you want in regards to a great game. And once again, even though the finish by the finish because of that, you know, that pass interference call, the holding call, it affected everything. But that was not the reason why uh, the Chiefs won. But it was a, a great, great game. Halftime show. Uh, shouts out to Rihanna for being the first uh, woman to perform while being pregnant. Uh, with that being said, of course, her being pregnant did take away from her doing more. Not saying she's like, you know, Sierra or Beyonce or anything, but she may have done a little bit more if she wasn't pregnant. But for what she did, everything she did, being up, stories high in the air and everything, she still held things down. So I won't say anything negative at all. It just wasn't as good as you would have hoped if she wasn't, you know, having a little bun in the oven. But overall, uh, everything to me was great. Oh, oh, Chris Stapleton, y'all. That man has some soul. I'm like, whoa, yeah. he always had me turn up. I mean, he, he did soul. that anthem. He did that anthem proud. I'm like, let's go. You should see him let's... in concert. The whole concert has you in chill bumps the entire time. Yeah, I was definitely impressed. Uh, shouts out to Cheryl Lee Ralph doing uh, the Black National Anthem. Uh, Babyface held things down as well. So, I mean, this overall... Uh, it was it was cool and shouts out to Tubi and that commercial because that <laughs> that changed that everything. Commercial that was the best one. It had people going crazy all over the social uh social media and everything. Like, hey, so, what you doing, man? Like, right, right. Doing? And, and, man, I, and I knew it was a commercial, but I just want to see what they're gonna say. Then someone else was like, "Yeah, what's going on?" And he like, "That ain't me. <laughs> that ain't me doing that." <laughs> I didn't I didn't know it was a commercial at first because. I, Cause I must have taken my eye off the TV for a second. I turn up and I see this thing coming up here. I said, "RJ, what are you doing, man? I'm like what?" And I'm like, "Oh, ne ne never mind, ne never mind. Just go back to playing with that iPad." I thought he was controlling the TV with that iPad for a second. <laughs> like, what are you doing? How could you do that? So yes, Miss Dub, the holding call was justified. It, it was a holding. It just happened at the wrong time, and it was like right in front of the ref. And like I said, just bad timing. But it they was the right field goal range. They were already in yeah. field goal range at that point. She says it looked iffy to her. That fumble did change the momentum in regards to Jalen Hurts. Uh, it still came down to the last few seconds. In regards to Rihanna, her music and voice were excellent. So hey, she did approved. Did y'all see that platform? <laughs> the platform. <laughs> Did y'all see that platform she was on when she, she was on there and it went like this? Did y'all see that? I yeah. was I was terrified. I said, please do not let this turn into a national tragedy. <laughs> yeah. So there is a clip of one of her dancers actually falling while dancing on stage, but he got out real quick. 
but he was like almost towards the end of the stage and he was he he fell over while he was dancing but got right back up. I'm like, oh my god, that would have whoo. The, the only <laughs> thing I could think of with her when she was on there was that that microphone stand was most likely bolted on there. So right. she had, you know, three points of contact basically. But I was like, I saw that thing and she was on there and it said, whoop. I said, what what is happening? I thought it was funny right. they had um memes out there of the whole setup saying it looks like a Mario, <laughs> a Super <laughs> Mario part. Yeah, they had <laughs> Mario did, and, you know? and Bowser. No, 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 no. For all the St. Louis people out there, there was the Queens of Carpet reference. Yeah, that. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody yeah. else had like had like 50,000 marshmallows going around the stage, and then she was like the, the red gummy bear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the white people the sign language lady killed it. Yes, if you haven't seen the sign, the sign language lady, man, she was turned up doing all this and all this dancing. I mean, she was she was getting it, but it, <laughs> Ms. Williams said definitely queen of carpets, <laughs> but it was definitely entertaining. Uh, last. But not least, Sadal, your thoughts. I think the Super Bowl was very entertaining and um, um, very close game. And it's, it, it was going to come down to mistakes. You know, I think I agree with all of you all points. Um, I think the difference with the game ultimately was that fumble. Because in a seesaw game, every possession counts. And that fumble was one of the turning points uh, of the game when um, Jalen Hurts fumbled the ball and they ran it back and scored. And then another another one was a, I think it was a false start penalty for the Eagles. Right. To the Mac. Mm-hmm. And then, then they, uh, I think yeah. they uh, had a turnover on downs. That, that one did it too. It was just, it just came down to the wire. But I'm telling you what, one thing I've seen, Jalen Hurts is that dude. Mm-hmm. I think Jalen Hurts played out of his mind, and the rest of the Eagles just played good. And and as far as the Chiefs side, I think when we talk about Patrick Mahomes, he's not next. He's now. Mm. He's the best quarterback in the National Football League. He's the face of the league. And so, and he solidified it. Two Super Bowl uh, wins, two MVPs, Super Bowl uh, MVPs, two Super Bowl MVPs. I mean, he's he's the face of the league. He's the best. And there's no question now. I mean, it was a debate a little bit on who it could be, but I think he settled the critics after the, the Super Bowl there. Um, but I would be remiss since we haven't met in a couple of weeks to at least talk about what happened before the Super Bowl. At least talk about the NFC championship game and my thoughts about the NFC championship game. Please do. I mean, I mean, it's only fair, right? I mean, I do. Yeah, yeah, it's, you know, talk about hey, it. Hey, so let's bring it. Okay, so so my thoughts are is you know, but the game. I'm at a loss of words. I I can't I can't put together the words to express how I feel. I think the only way I could really show you how I feel is just to 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 show you this. <laughs> That's fantastic analysis. I'm sure yeah. ESPN 101 would love to have you. Yeah, sure I know. Would. I know. That was my best work. <laughs> so, 
Let's talk about those Eagles. I mean, I mean, taking out two quarterbacks in one game, and then do you feel like maybe they were trying to target Patrick Mahomes as well? I mean, they went right after that ankle, like put all the weight they could on that ankle. Wait, right wait, the wait, what, what, that. The quarterbacks? You, you said going after the quarterback? This is the 49ers. They played most of the season with a backup quarterback. Oh, and then when their backup quarterback went down, they played with the third string quarterback and mm-hmm. won how many games in a row? Mm-hmm. They, how many games in a row they win? Now, first of all, you should know. They, that, wait a you minute, wait know. a minute. Hold up. So they've played with three, three quarterbacks and What's a fourth four string quarterback? I mean, you're already playing with the third string quarterback. You won. So how many games in a row? I, I mean, you but can't the fourth string that? quarterback, the four I mean, string quarterback got a concussion. But the They're fourth the string 90, quarterback, the four string quarterback got a concussion in the game. So I mean, it's, I mean, it's I mean, it's the look, they got the number one defense in the league. I mean, they they won so many games. I mean, surely. Surely they can overcome that little thing. <laughs> Quarterback injuries? <laughs> I don't know of another team suffering injuries that, that prevented them from doing their best in the game. <laughs> I four can't think of anything. Any four quarterbacks like in one season, all out, and you're like, ah, the test. Come on, man. Come on, man. I just remember someone scoffing at the idea of injuries preventing someone. A team to winning. I mean, huh, they just suck. I mean, let's look, 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 we can we can laugh and we can joke and we can do all that other stuff, but listen, at the end of the day, if you don't have a quarterback in the game who should even be in the game that can actually throw the ball, if the team knows that you're gonna run on every play, there's no game. Like, come on. Hey. I was led to believe, you know, I, I, I take, I take your football wisdom seriously. You told me this 49ers team was going all the way. They were, they were Super Bowl 57 champions. I mean, a, a team like this doesn't let things like backup quarterbacks stop them. You know, listen, here's the thing. You're, you're, you're embarrassing yourself, okay? Because, listen, we got a lot of people out here who listen to the Platform Sports Talk Show on a weekly basis, yeah. and they know honest commentary when they see it. And they know that this is very dishonest and very disingenuous of you to try to make it seem like, ah, they should just be able to do blah, 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 blah. Come on. Come on. Do you want me to play hey, listen. clips of hey, listen. With, listen. With, with a certain somebody with the sweater? We've heard from you. We've heard from you. Let's hear from the audience. Do you feel like it is really fair to give the criticism to the 49ers out there that Sadal, the selector, the investment DJ, <laughs> DJ, the real estate? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The, the realist, the, 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 the fake estate D- DJ out there. Ooh. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> hey, listen, let's ask the audience. Can y'all please leave a comment in YouTube, Facebook, Twitter? Let us know. Do y'all think that the 49ers are, are – do you feel like he is besmirching the good name of the San Francisco 49ers after what – listen, those mm. are the circumstances. Let's be honest. I just feel disappointed. I really did. You well, know, you should be disappointed because the disappointed. Rams weren't even sniffing the playoffs this year. So, listen, I mean, mm. let's hey. be real. What hey. one of us had a team that actually could talk about the playoffs? The other one, the only thing all these, talk about was all these, all these shots fired. Look at that! Look, you can't even see it. You know why? Because the system <laughs> don't even want you to see what that is. Blur it out. Look like some type of nineteen nineties uh, a music video, rap video out there. <laughs> Oh, I love it. So I you were watching it. the DVD this past Sunday, just like I predicted you would. Mm-hmm. I have a DVD. Where's your DVD? Oh, 
they didn't make DVDs back when the 49ers last one. I'm sorry. Mm. Mm-hmm. Listen, listen, let this be a lesson to you, T-Bone. You know, it's something about, I don't, I don't remember that saying quite well about something about writing checks that you can't cash. Hmm. Yeah. Maybe perhaps you should have a more realistic approach with your commentary with your team. A realistic approach. Well, listen, at the end of the day, I can admit that my team, look, they went down in a blaze of glory in the NFC Championship game. They did everything they could to at least try to win the game. Uh, that's more than could be said for the Rams when they faced the 49ers during the season. So, um, yeah, you're I don't right. know what to tell you. That yeah, you right. lost. Yeah, we lost. And at the end of the day, yeah. Chiefs, Chiefs are the Super Bowl champions. And, uh, you know, it was a good game. The, four, the Eagles, they're on my list. They're on the list with the Falcons. I ain't they're forgot on the, the list. Falcons? I just I, all I have to say, all I have Hold to on. say is Hold um on. Falcons, I ain't forgot y'all from 1998 with Garrison Hurst. Hmm? I ain't forgot mm. he broke that man's leg in the playoffs. Mm. He took it and there. Went on lose to Denver. See, that should be that should be a lesson right now. You 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 injure a significant 49er in the playoff, you're gonna lose in the Super Bowl. It happened to the Falcons when they went to face Denver. I think it was 99, actually, now that I think about it. But you know, they lost to Denver. And the Eagles lost to the Chiefs. Let that be a lesson to you. Yep. Now, yeah, something I do want to. Sometimes paper champions don't win the real thing. Oh. Paper champions don't even make it to the playoffs the next season. Oh. Oh. Oh, yeah. Y'all, y'all come with it. it. Are you, are you, are you foreshadowing? <laughs> I, don't even think, I don't even think y'all were paper champions. More like tissue. No, we, Ooh, we, we won bit of water the real championship. Right you. We won Ooh. the real championship last year. You did. How many does that make? Two, yeah. Hey, more, but guys, speaking, generation. speaking of tissue, uh, let's talk about that that field that they played on this past Sunday. A lot of slippage Ice going on, re- right? <laughs> and you know, and, and of all the games, you know, that's the last game that you want to experience players sliding, like you said, so all ice skating or whatever. Apparently, the NFL invests like eight hundred thousand dollars on this field. They've been working on it for two years. They need to get that. But then they on. decided, but they decided weeks leading up to the Super Bowl to paint on the grass. <laughs> to paint on the grass. Then it's a video where because Arizona has that dome where you can have the field move and go outside and to have the sun hit. But still, you have to do a better job in regards to especially the Super Bowl. But I've been hearing that Arizona's fields, even before then, has been a, a big issue. But that's a certain thing that can't not happen. You know, the Eagles players didn't say it, hey, it didn't affect us winning or losing the game, whatever. But still, you can't have all this slippage going on at a big game. I mean, it was unacceptable, man. Um, you had how many weeks to prepare this the field? I mean – they have the type of field that can slide out into the, the elements, you know. It's almost like a big cookie sheet, you know. Um, and so you have an opportunity to really prepare the, the turf for the game. I mean, this is, I mean, right. unacceptable. It's the, it's the biggest game of the year. You know it's coming. Um, and somebody lost their jobs uh, after that one. Right. But it just seems like the end. Seems like, excuse me, the NFL always finds a way to do something stupid. And I tell you what, and, and I've been watching the Super Bowl ever since Super Bowl twenty five. I haven't missed the Super Bowl. Um, Ram, it man. was. Oh damn! What, hmm? what was no. that? Huh? You said something. <laughs> <laughs> you said something. <laughs> I haven't missed watching the Super Bowl. Um, and uh, I mean, this was one of the better, you know, festiv- festivities and everything, but that doggone feel was the thing that just messed it, messed it up, messed up, took a little bit of uh, luster off the, the whole, the whole, uh, weekend. Mm. 
And so something else outside of, well, I guess it kind of does relate to the Super Bowl. But the NFL has announced that they might change the coaching hiring rules and will start waiting till after the Super Bowl to hire a coach. And that's something that I like because how many yeah. times do you see after the regular season during the playoffs that a team that didn't win a lot during the season will fire their you know current coach and then they'll hire someone the next week later. Give every candidate an opportunity to win that position, earn that position after all the games are over. Not regular season, but all the games. So that's a, a smart move if they approve it. That would be a very smart move for the NFL to wait until every game of the season is over. And now let's go ahead and see about these candidates. I think Wait, that's the fair. Going? I think that's the fair thing to do. Um, when you're looking at um, you know, teams that are are preparing for uh big games, um, the last thing you want is distractions uh with your coaching staff. And I'll tell you what. I don't know. They need to do something with um, the rating of these these coaching staffs because uh, my team has felt it over the last five years, man. But um, there's nothing you can do about that. But at least have a fair uh, period where you have uh, all the teams who vying for the coaches at the same time. I think it's the only uh, fair thing to do. I was asking, what's the what's the overall problem? Is is it what are we saying doesn't happen in the way that it, that it was? So you have coaches who are still in the Super Bowl or in the playoffs that can't really have that full opportunity to interview for a coaching position that's open, while teams are still hiring other coaches while you're still playing in the season. Didn't they announce that so, that the, what was it? The Eagles offensive coordinator was just selected for the Cardinals job. Is that right, or somebody right, else? Yeah, that was, that was just today. But the uh, OC and the DC was announced uh, just today. But it, what, I'm, what I'm saying is, even before that, during the wild card round, someone got hired. During the uh, divi uh, divisional round, someone else got hired. But let's wait until all these coaches are done coaching. So then certain guys who may not have had the opportunity to even get an interview could get the interview because they may be more impressive than the person who you chose just like that because you already had a preconceived notion of who you wanted to get. And that's been the problem with the NFL is that these teams, especially against black coaches, they always have these preconceived notions of who they want to go ahead and, and, and hire before the season, the, the full season is over. Give every candidate an opportunity by waiting till after the season is done and then go through the full hiring process. And I think that's the better move because it gives every coach an opportunity to prove themselves. Here's, here's the only problem is that one thing we've learned about the NFL is when owners have preconceived notions, don't matter what rules you put in place, it ain't going to change their mind. So, I mean, it's not like the rule now says, hey, uh, after the Super Bowl, you have to pick from these top playoff contending uh, coordinators or whatever, and those are the ones that have to get the jobs first. So it's not going to change. It's not going to make it that. So I don't know. It seems like a, a rule that's put in place to make it sound good, but I'll, I'd have to see what the actual results would be. I think um, having a period of time, like say uh, the Thursday after the Super Bowl, to where, to where um, the period of signing other teams' coaches start. I think Thursday or Friday after the Super Bowl it gives a, not enough time to where it, if you're the Super Bowl champion, you get to celebrate with your team, have your parade, and then, you know, go ahead and then go for those interviews at the same time. It's not like that in college, though. Like college It should be. A lot of a lot of things in college. They the NCAA is 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 just as messed up as the NFL. Well, probably worse. But I mean, like the NFL is not going to wait until after a bowl game to to look for their uh, coach. You know what I mean? Like they were talking about Harbaugh before all the bowls and stuff were going on. Remember? But you know, so I guess 
I guess next year when the Rams are looking for their next head coach, you know, I guess it'll work out for them, I guess. Yeah, well, you know, um, you just you need, you need to worry about getting a new defensive coordinator. That's something that actually happened this year, okay? <laughs> so, speaking of something happening this year, matter of fact, this week coming up, NFL is done, but this Sunday is the return of XFL. There we go, Joe. XFL is back. I know, Sadal, you have about, what, three weeks until they come back to the Lou. I yes. plan on going to the game to see if the, if the white people want to go check out the Battle Hawks when they play their home opener in about three weeks. But, Joe, uh, how excited are you about the Battle Hawks and XFL 3.0? I'm pumped because we, we had so much fun watching them when they were here um, in 2020. Um, sadly, you know, it got like, cut off because of the um, pandemic, but I'm pumped. It sucks because I was kind of getting used to, you know, uh, Teamu and, you know, everyone we had on our last team. So I'm excited to get to learn uh, these new these new players. And I'm just excited to watch, you know, a football team in St. Louis. It doesn't matter if it's silly or whatever. I'm just excited to watch them. And right now it gives us something to watch on Sundays before baseball comes around. Uh, look, I'm looking forward to it, too. I mean, I'll, I'll be working four blocks from the Dome, although, you know, during the week. But, you know, maybe that parking can still work for going to the games, too. You know, so I, uh, I'm i looking forward to it. I'm, I'm going to try to get to some games this year. I want to get to some more local sports, support those teams. Yeah, well, I already got my season tickets, so I'm ready. I already oh. got uh, all my, my XFL gear from the last time. Didn't get any new gear. But I mean, it is it's I'm a football fan um, at the end of the day, and I have the opportunity to once again cheer for a hometown football team. And, you know, um, I know last year or not last year, but, you know, two years ago when they were here, it was just a different kind of atmosphere, man. Um, it just felt it just felt different. Um Everybody was excited for the team. Um, really didn't matter who was on the team, how good they were. We were just happy that football is back. And I was actually reading up on some of the XFL teams and on their odds. Las Vegas is giving the best odds for the championship to the St. Louis Battlehawks. Good call. Uh, yep. Okay. Um, and all the all the polling. They, they put up a poll, a fan poll that says, okay, who are all of the, you know, who has the most uh, fans? And, of course, St. Louis Battlehawks won that, too. Ca -ca. So it's all it's all <laughs> coming together. Ca -ca. Cause the law. I love it. I love it. Yeah, I'm definitely excited, man. Uh, like I said, we had an awesome uh, commercial uh, shoot that we did in front of the, the, the Dome a few years back. It was a fun time. The atmosphere was crazy. I got so my I got my Battle Hawk blue uh Pumas ready. Hey, I ain't even I ain't even wear them yet. I'm gonna wear them at the first game. Let's go. Let's go. Definitely exciting time. And it's just really cool that we had the opportunity to have the head coach of the Battle Hawks, Anthony Beck, on the man cave. So I'm gonna post that link uh before the game uh this weekend so people can see the interview. Because we are a part of history and getting the coach on and everything before the season started. So I'm excited. And I really feel because of the way that The Rock, the Dwayne Johnson handles business, I feel like this is going to be a success. He's going to make sure everything is him and, and his uh, his ex, uh, Danny Garcia. They're going to make sure that everything is done correctly, done professionally, and, and it's going to be entertaining. So I'm excited. Look forward to it between the Battle Hawks. Uh, and uh, St. Louis City SC starting up uh, next month. Then, of course, we had last week our special guest, uh, Ross Schaefer, representing from the St. Louis uh, Shock Pickleball team. Great interview last week, so check that out as well. So just a lot of great things are going on around the St. Louis area. So I want to catch, definitely... catch a soccer right. game, man. I want to oh, catch yeah. a soccer game. Uh, I know I can't make the opener. You know, it's sold out. But I wonder yeah. if I can get, you know, to some of these other games. Yeah, but St. Louis got a whole lot going on, and I just hope that, you know, we continue to support 
and enjoy uh, these fun times. Sadal, that was our football talk, man. I appreciate you being on, and you have a great rest of your evening, bro. All right, go Rams, go go Hawks. Ka-ka! See you on the man. See you in the man cave. <laughs> All right, y'all. This is the platform sports talk show. I'm your boy Smooth, along with T Bone. And from the Boondocks. Joke. <laughs> See, after this, you're going to say something like, yeah, you know, something. And this be like, yeah. Joke. <laughs> I don't know. I got to come up with something creative. All right. So, uh, it's that time. Joe has the blues. So, they had their, their break about two weeks off. The blues have came back now, one, two in a row. Uh, so, of course, Trying to get uh, St. Louis. <laughs> right. So St. Louis the Blues on uh Terracinco. Oh, 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 oh. Wait a minute. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Wait a minute. <gasps> New York Rangers. <laughs> Vladimir Bear Terracinco is uh, of course no longer a blue. It was something that we've been talking about for the last couple of years now, since that big hoopla about him not trusting the trainers and everything with the blues management, the whole nine. But now that he's gone, it seems like there's more uh, of a freeness with this team. They've been playing, not saying he's been the reason why, but Joe, just in your opinion, from what you've seen over the last couple of games now, uh, have you seen a dramatic difference with this Blues team with uh, Tarasenko gone? I wouldn't say dramatic. It's just I figured, you know, the guy's been wanting out of St. Louis for two and a half years now. I'm sure there was – maybe a little bit of a riff in the locker room because of that. Maybe a little bit of a riff with him and the fans. Um, but I don't think it's dramatic. You know, I just think maybe it's it's a little easier to get along and play on the ice. And they don't have anything to lose right now. So I think they just they have their break and they're playing free and easy, but they're gonna lose more guys. Uh, there's Barbashev's name's been thrown around. Um, I'm sure there's gonna be a defenseman I think on the sh- on ladies' night a couple weeks ago, I said Tarasenko and a defenseman, and I think I named uh, Mikola, and he's gone as well. So, um, you know, All I right. wouldn't be surprised if Barbie's gone by the deadline and possibly someone else, you know. Um, O'Reilly's name keeps getting thrown around as well. I know he has, which him and Barbie are the same way. Barbie says he wants to be in the playoffs this year, but he wants to sign here in St. Louis as well. So, um, I don't know. It's Army's got a lot of stuff, a lot of decisions to make. And um, I was just kind of shocked how fast the Tarasenko trade happened. But that must mean that, you know, this is going to be the best offer that they had, which I thought it was a pretty good one. And um, Tarasenko, he had the no trade clause. So, you know, he got to go gets to go play with his one of his best friends, Panarin. So I think it was honestly a win, win, win for everyone. And uh, Miss Williams, real quick, going back to football. Yes, we did discuss the Pro Bowl, the Pro Bowl format uh, on last week's show. So definitely uh, check out last week's show, as I did kind of break down the Pro Bowl. I thought it was definitely uh, very much improved from what I've seen. The players liked it. It was more energy and just the different uh, games that they played amongst each other, competition, and then of course the actual flag football game. So. Yes, the Pro Bowl, the Pro Bowl, excuse me, was uh, much better. But yes, uh, Joe, uh, I'm just looking forward to seeing how this team is going to play uh, from now on to the end of the season. I have a feeling that they they are going to hold on to Ryan O'Reilly. I just feel like he's that that piece that you just want to have that one person where you can bridge from the old to the new that 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 transition, and you mm-hmm. got to have that one person who should be the perfect representative of that change. So I have a feeling, I mean, I may be wrong. It may happen, you know, tomorrow before, you know, the deadline, but I just have a feeling that out of all the people, o- O'Reilly will be the one that's going to stay, but you know. And I think he should stay. I mean, he's, he became the captain like two years ago. You, you can't keep, it's like the coach situation, you know, what the blues have had my entire life is, you know, just, a revolving door, new coach, new coach, new coach constantly. And I kind of felt like that with the uh, captains here for a little bit. So uh, I think he's going to stay. He's 
been very vocal about how much he loves St. Louis, how much he loves the Blues, and I just don't see them getting rid of him. And like you said, it could happen tomorrow. But um, I know I'll be upset if that happens because he was injured this year, so he still has a lot to prove. And being a captain means a lot more than just being good on the ice. You know, it's being a leader. So um, I I think he's going to be a Blue until the rest of his career. Yeah, I feel that as well. So before we let you go, Joe, of course, we got to discuss spring training is here. So as you brought up, right. So as you brought up earlier, Joe, uh, in which I love to see y'all. So I love going on social media and see all the baseball writers uh, leaving the photos and videos of batting practice and fielding practice and just coming together and walking from this place to there, from their car to, you know, wherever. I love this time of year because it's like, yes, here it comes. <laughs> the moment we, we all been all waiting be, for. We could all be positive about it for like a week. And then, we're, right, and then, right. we, <laughs> then we turn all negative. <laughs> all right. So um, with that being said, what is something, Joe, that you're looking forward to seeing during spring training that you want to take away from the Cardinals during this spring training? Oh, man, it's it's the competition with all these very young, talented studs that are coming. I mean, we've been seeing pictures of Jordan Walker, Tink Hentz, Michael McGreevy, um, Mason Wynn. But then we also have guys like Nolan Gorman, Juan Yepes. Um, you know, Carlson has a lot to prove. It's There's a lot right there. And with, you know, the WBC, you're going to have all these guys having all the opportunity in the world during spring training to prove that they belong on this team. So that is my main thing. Like, obviously, my main focus should probably be the rotation. But right now, just seeing all these, you know, these young kids right now and they're going to be up here, big league camp, trying to prove themselves that they should be on this team. That's that's my main focus right now because I was just telling Brendan, I was like, I don't know, who, is Gorman going to start in AAA this year? Is is Walker going to come up here and be a DH right away? Or is he going to – it's just – it's not a terrible thing. It's a good thing, but I stress myself right now thinking about it because there's just so many opportunities for all these guys. And t how about yourself? Well, I haven't been able to really follow spring training yet. Uh, normally, at this time of year, I'll be um, searching out, seeing if I could catch spring training games. But obviously, circumstances are changing, so I'll be seeing more of the regular season this year. But, um, you know, I'll uh, probably over the next couple of weeks, I'll probably be getting more acclimated with what's going on with baseball because uh, I'll have more time on my hands. So, how far is Jupiter, Florida from Orlando? Uh, it's about two and a half hours. I've actually never been to Jupiter to see a game. I've been to, um, what's the uh, the town? I've been to where the Mets play, and they used uh, to play Port out Lucy. here. Huh? Port St. Lucie? Yes, Port St. Lucie. I couldn't think of it. But, yeah, I've been to Port St. Lucie and seen them out there. And then, you know, the Astros used to play out in uh, Kissimmee, so it didn't used to be too far away. Yeah, I would love to check out spring, a spring training game or even just go to where they're at right now and just watch them go to their drills and everything. I would love to see that personally, so maybe we can make that happen. Uh, you know, we shall see. But in regards to myself, I would have to say what I'm looking forward to this spring training is embrace the challenge. People like Paul the Young, they know he knows that people are, have eyes on him. Are you? Are you? Uh, are you wasted? Are you? Are you back? You've been working hard. Embrace it. You know what I'm saying. Take it all in and show up and show out. Bottom line, embrace it. Don't wilt under the pressure. Don't put too much pressure on yourself where you can't be be you. Embrace it. You know, if someone is, is hating on your game or whatever it is. Embrace the hate, embrace everything, and come out this spring training and 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 be a difference maker. Because if for some way, somehow, Paul DeYoung goes back to how he was when he first started, Joe, could you imagine more wins and, and how great the offense could be if Paul DeYoung was a solid 
a contributor every day in the lineup, not just once a week, but co- consistently and not always striking out, but hitting homers. I mean, he could really change the whole lineup. The same thing with Jack Flirty. You know, people have been talking about you and the whole night. Can you be healthy? Can you stay, you know, on the team and, and, and do this and do that? Embrace all that and come out and, and put in the work during this offseason and be consistent during the regular season because he's another guy. If he's healthy and he is actually performing like an ace, Joe, this team can dramatically change from being second tier to being right up there to the top tier. Yeah, and I agree, but that's just – that's what it's been the last handful of years is the, the two-letter word, if – you know, like we, we need, we know we need Jack Flaherty. If he does this, we look like a different team. You know, if Paul DeYoung or whoever, Tyler O'Neill could do this, then yes, we'd be a different looking team. So it's just, I guess, like you said, embrace it, try to put everything you have on the line and try to have a good spring, make this team. And, but whenever, you know, March 30th comes around, you have to start showing it because, you know, guys like DeYoung, they've had enough opportunities. So we'll see what happens with, you know, someone like him. And some more people who I want to say embrace it. You have guys like Jordan Walker, you know, coming in as a rookie. Embrace the challenge. I have a feeling he's the kind of guy that wants that pressure on him. He's like, okay, you know what? If y'all don't think I can hit 30 home runs the first year of my season? Watch me. He, he kind of has that aura, you know, about him. Uh, guys like Moises Gomez, and uh, and and speaking of which, I think Tyler O'Neill Joe has some competition because <laughs> if you haven't seen Moises Gomez and He's Jordan Walker, dude. I mean, look at Both this. I mean, look at this on the right, Moises Gomez. This dude here, he makes Tyler O'Neill look like Tommy Etman right now. <laughs> <laughs> He, he uh, it would be his first year in, in the majors if he makes the team. He uh, had a breakout year last year in AAA, and of course, on the left hand side, he had Jordan Walker. He's like six, what six, 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 six seven. Five. Yeah, I mean, he he's he just he he's a beast. And but you look at 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 uh, Ali Marmo right behind Moses Gomez. He has that look like, oh yeah, baby, <laughs> 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 let's go. <laughs> you know, like he's excited so. If these guys just show up and show out, like I said before, and some that Ali and Mozilla said to the, uh, recently during their press conference is that this is going to be a, a, a spring training where competition is going to be very, very key. Like it, it sometimes it's like, okay, well, we all to have our preconceived who's going to be starting. No, there's some spots that can be taken. So you can't just say, oh, because I'm Tyler O'Neill or I'm Dylan Carlson or I'm you know, whoever, I have the starting spot. No, you have to perform. And that's going to be the best way to make this team be the best that they can be day in and day out is competition amongst each other. So I look forward to that. Yeah, it's going to be exciting. And like I said, got a lot of these young kids coming up and they don't want to go back to double A AA or triple A. They want, to, they want to be up here in the loose. So it's going to be fun to watch. Right. And lastly, Joe, you brought up the WBC, the World Baseball Classic. Um, are you looking more forward to the WBC or in regards to the progression for the Cardinals? Because you're going to have a lot of young guys playing because of the Nolans, the, the Arenados, and the Goldsmiths going to be gone. So more playing time for Walker and Gomez and Mesa Wynn and other guys. So – are you more excited for the WBC or for uh, the spring training and these young guys getting that actual opportunity to prove themselves? Uh, the WBC only because, I mean, 2017, we had a really good look at that and how exciting it was. And I think something like the WBC this year is going to be big and huge for, huge for the game of baseball itself. So obviously I'm going to be paying attention to all the stuff that the Cardinals are doing with Walker and Wynn and all of them, but it's going to be awesome for just the game of baseball for the world to see the type of atmosphere that it brings and, um, you know, the best of the best out there competing. 
Nice, nice, nice. Well, that being said, Joe, thank you for your time this evening. You also have a great rest of your evening. You too. Have a good night, guys. See ya. See ya. All right. Once again, this is your Wednesday night sports delight. We need everyone right now to go ahead and get them likes, get them shares going. T-Bone, one more time, let everybody know if they just tuned in, how they can uh, find us on all them social media sites. Well, I'm glad you said that because for those of y'all who watch Sadal out here just completely talk about the, the 49ers in such a disparaging way, send your hate mail to platform sports talk show at gmail.com and let him know. We don't appreciate that. You can also send a message on Instagram at platform sports talk, or you can go and leave a comment under this video because most of y'all are watching on YouTube. That's right. And when you watch on YouTube, man, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Go ahead and hit that like. And go ahead and hit that bell. Bell, that's right. Because uh, you know, when we go live, we want y'all to know that we will. You will be notified. That's right. That's right. So look, you can catch us on Roku. A lot of y'all watch on that. We also got Hot Three Sixty Five Radio, where it's always hot. Catch us on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Hot Three Sixty Five Radio. Get to check us out through that. Uh, you know, hey, help that grow. Help those people out. To help the, help support all of us overall. Let's check out the shows that we got. Right now, y'all watching the Platform Sports Talk Show. We also have on the first Wednesday of the month, we have Ladies Night. You'll be able to catch Joe, Bunny, and the rest of the crew out there. You'll be able to see exactly what they have to say about their point of view. And on the last Wednesday of every month, we got the Man Cave. That's right. You'll catch me and uh, Sadal as well. And uh, you'll be able to see all the rest of the fellas out there as we give our points of view every last Wednesday of the month. And, uh, you know, as Smooth pointed out earlier, hey, look, we want to hear from y'all. Who do y'all want to hear? Who do y'all want to see? You know, who's got who's got the good stories that we need to share out here on the Platform Sports Talk Show? Hey, look, you go ahead and send us a message. Sit, hit us up on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. However, hey, look, y'all saw the list. Y'all saw it. Hey, right. y'all didn't remember? It's easy. Hit that little 10-second button, hit it one more time, and hit one more time, and you'll be able to see that full list. That's how this works. There it is. And now, everyone, it is that time. It's the it's the main event, y'all. This next hour, some change about to be incredible. This man here, born and raised in Detroit, Michigan, played high school ball at Detroit Renaissance High School, went to M-I-Z-Z-O-U. He got drafted, y'all go play in the NBA. Then he has played professionally overseas for the last up 10 years. We look forward to talking about all those experiences and more. I would want to get this man on for the longest time. I, I've been inspired to do so. Uh, thanks to someone I know very well who's watching right now. Love you, mama. And uh, it's, it's a pleasure. It's an honor and a pleasure to have a legend. And I had to say he's a legend because when I saw this man balling at Mizzou, I'm like, man, he got some game. He He's that dude. And like to me, no matter what school you went to or where he played at, he always had the number 23. So I got to find out why. And we're going to find out right now on the Platform Sports Talk Show. Everyone, welcome. Bring in the comments, the likes, and shares. Let's go as we have Mr. Ricky. Paulden, what is going on, brother? What's up, man? How's it going? Hey, smooth. That ain't man. how you do that. No, 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 no. Smooth. That ain't how you do that. No, 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 no. You know, you know. <laughs> he's from Detroit. You know, it's just like when someone is in St. Louis, you ask what high school you went to. When you get someone from Detroit on the show, you always start with, hey, what up, though? What up, though? What up, right. oh. <laughs> What up, though? <laughs> hey, it's good to have you all, man. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to be on the platform sports talk show. Uh, no problem, man. Happy to be here. I know, like we've been we've been trying to figure it out. I'm horrible on social media and getting back, so I apologize for that, man. But I'm glad I can finally get on with you guys. Hey, once again, we appreciate. We know you know people are, are busy, and I'm very uh, persistent, especially to those I really want to have on the show and have their story told, man. So once again, thank you very much. And uh, how things been going with you so far, man, uh, for 2023? Man, things have been going well. Uh, just just recently retired last summer. I 
And so uh, just, man, getting back to you, living in America, I've uh, been in Germany, you know, past 15 years and just a transition of not being a basketball player anymore and uh, just trying to figure that out. And, you know, my kids are growing and watching them do other things. So uh, it's a, uh, it's a fun time, but also uh, kind of uncharted, try to waters for me. You know, it, it kind of reminds me for you just saying that, for those who watched uh Shaw Shank Redemption and when Morgan Freeman's character was in jail, for, you know, all them years and he finally got <laughs> out and he was like, okay, I don't know how to live normal. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like exactly, you said, man. I'll be like, you know, you, you play ba- high school basketball, then you play in college basketball. So you always been like, you know, on the on the go, always been busy. Then, like you just said, to be in Germany for over 15 years and now coming back here, I know it has to be like, oh, man, how, what, what am I going to do? It's changed. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's crazy. Uh, sometimes in a good way, like I, I miss conveniences of being back in the United States and uh, – you know, definitely miss the fam and, and old friends and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, man, like you said, like I've been playing basketball, you know, my whole life and basketball has always uh, told me where I needed to be or when I needed to practice and how my summers would look and all those things. And now it's just like, OK, that's over. And uh, you kind of got to make some some big boy decisions and kind of figure out on your own what you want to do. So for me, it's been a, it's been an adjustment and, and still trying to figure out what exactly what I want to do and, and uh, you know, how I want to move about this, this next phase of my life. Well, once again, we're very big in regards to getting stories told and giving flowers to those who definitely deserve it. So let's take it all the way back to when you were a little kid, you know, little Ricky. And uh, just tell us when would you say that you first fell in love with sports? Uh, Growing up as a kid, I always played sports. It was one of the things, you know, like when you growing up, uh, moms was like, hey, you got to get out of the house. You can't be in the house all day or you can't keep going running back and forth. So, you know, we've all I've always played sports growing up, whether it's baseball or football, uh, basketball. And then, um, after schools, just on the court hooping um, and I actually had a community center that I had to go to after school because my mom works. So kind of like a latchkey thing. And uh, that's when I first started playing basketball. I played on three on three tournament. And uh, I got to play up because I was a little bit taller and I just just fell in love with the game right there. I saw I could compete. Um, I was still definitely rusty and uh, didn't have a lot of a lot of skills at that time. But I was tall and I was always pretty athletic. So um, I figured that was that was my sport. You know, I I tried baseball and football and uh, football. You get hit one time. That was that was enough for me. (laughs) <laughs> and the baseball I just could hit. I'm a I'm a huge baseball fan. I love watching baseball now. Uh, my my son plays, and um, I just I just just couldn't hit, man. I I didn't have the patience and the and the, and the drive to kind of figure that out. So I just kind of stuck with basketball. Mm, okay. So like no no track or anything. Nah, they tried to get me run track in high school, but you know I was just so focused on basketball. Um, that was my main sport and. I, I hate running, if I'm being honest. So I hate preseason conditioning and all that stuff. I remember we had to run uh, cross country for basketball. That was our that was our conditioning. And, I, you know, I hated every minute of it, uh, every minute of it. But, uh, you know, I knew it helped. But I definitely wasn't trying to run track or do anything, you know, after basketball season. And, you know, it's funny you say that because I was very similar where I didn't mind running at times. But I didn't want to do track and field. You know, I didn't want to do all that. You know, people say I was fast and everything, which I was, but I just did not Uh want to do track. I just couldn't, I couldn't stomach it. Uh, Miss Williams, our favorite fan, says, uh, sound like your natural talent was for basketball. I I believe it was. Uh, That's just where my my passion was. I I think I was pretty athletic where had I played other sports, I would have, been able to, you know, to hold my own, but uh, just basketball always held my interest. And, uh, you know, growing up in Detroit, watching the Pistons in the 80s and um, being a huge Michael Jordan fan, even though he was he was kind of the enemy, um, <laughs> I've always just just kind of gravitated to basketball. Mm. T-Bone, you had something? Oh, I, I got to ask because I know 
Way too many of my friends are from Detroit. So I'm going to need you to please tell me that during your high school basketball career at Renaissance, please tell me that you dunked on people from King, Ford, Central. I'm sure there's several other schools out there, but please tell me you dunked on people from those schools. Yeah, I got, I got, uh, I talked to some people from King, uh, but King, that was, <laughs> you know, a lot of my friends went there because I, that's why I went to school, uh, like elementary school and stuff. So I knew a lot of guys, but I, I caught a couple of bodies on, on the high schools because Renaissance at the time was a very small high school and uh, people, it wasn't really known for basketball. So like my junior and senior year, we kind of sort of put Renaissance on the map as far as basketball in the city. And uh, yeah, I, I, I caught a couple of bodies here and there. <laughs> hey, he was doing this back when it wasn't hot. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's up, man. So just tell us more about Detroit Renaissance High School. Cause you know, we, we from I'm from we from the Lou. So tell us about that yeah. high school. I know you said it's small, but just tell us more about that high school. What led you to go to that school and just your overall experience while being there? Uh, uh, Renaissance is like um, it's mainly known for academics. So it's a there are three schools in the city where you public schools that you got to test to kind of get into, and Renaissance is one of them. So uh, I just always, you know, academically, my mom wanted me to go there because especially it was a smaller school. Um, kind of, I'm a, I'm a shy guy naturally. And my personality is shy, so she thought you know a small school environment would be would be better for me. And uh, but Renaissance, I believe now and, and at the time was always ranked nationally as far as academics and stuff. And so that was my mom's main focus. She didn't care nothing about basketball. It was to uh, to give me a good education. And, you know, it was free. It was a it was a public school. So that was uh, that was something I benefited from. Um, and then I had I made varsity, didn't play my freshman year, but was on the team and uh, second year, got some more more time and. My junior year, we had a coaching change. This guy named was Mark White. And Mark White was, I guess you could say, he was Ricky Paulding at Renaissance before, you know, before I got there. You know, a guy that uh, did some amazing things in the city, went on to play in college and then I think a little bit overseas. And uh, he had come from uh, Detroit Persian was like, and if you know Detroit basketball, Detroit, Detroit Persian is like a big uh, basketball powerhouse in the city. And he came from that program and, um, he started the program at, at Renaissance and um, he saw me and I think he saw, he saw something in me, but uh, the main thing he taught me is uh, all the work I had to do, like running across country. Like I didn't think, I'm like, man, it's not, it's not basketball season. I condition, I get in shape when basketball season comes. But he was like, no, like we gotta, we gotta do this now. It's important for you. It's important for our team. Um, we didn't have a lot of great talent in Renaissance. Uh, we had some guys that can play, but as far as talent, like he he kind of knew that I had to be something special for our school and for our team. And he really, uh, really raised me and, and, and made me into a good player. And so um, a lot of the talent and stuff that I have have now is all due to, you know, to my guy, Mark White. And uh, so we had some success uh, my, my junior year and the senior year we uh you know, we were kind of one of the best schools, definitely in the city, and uh, won a city championship. Uh, got all our our guys to go play on and play college basketball, D one, D two, small schools. And uh, from there, there were some cats that came in there. Um, Joe Crawford, you know, he went to Kentucky, um, and then uh, Malik Harrison, who went went on to play in Oregon. And I think those guys had brief stints in the NBA. And that's when they, that's when Renaissance took off. Those guys were like nationally ranked and um, they won state championships. But, uh, you know, I was part of like the, the beginning of getting Renaissance that recognition and actually getting people wanting to come to Renaissance for uh, for for basketball. So I went to I don't know if you heard or not, but I went to Vashon High School and uh, there's one is yep. a, a big policy. So, you know, about it. OK. So, you know, playing for the B, especially because, you know, you're such a great team, that spotlight is on you, and it feels like you're already a superstar, you know, especially at least mm -hmm. a college superstar. So did you get that kind of vibe while you was there at Renaissance? 
I did kind of my senior year because uh, that's when all the attention started to, to come. There was like, well, this this small school renaissance is, you know, we had a really good summer where our coach was like, hey, like we, we, we show up, we playing everybody. We playing Persian, we're playing King. Like we're not running from nobody. We, we show it up and that's what we did. And we kind of got our name for ourselves. And um, so there was, there were a couple articles and stuff written about me in the school. And there was like kind of this, uh, like kind of this spotlight on me my senior year, but uh, uh, Mark White did a good job of, you know, helping me stay focused. And, and not that I, I don't think I would have got a big head at the time, but um, he made sure that my focus was strictly on basketball. So you mentioned Mark White, but were there any other influences that helped you out along the way in regards to developing your basketball uh, skills? Yeah, Mark White was big. Uh, I had, uh, you know, my coach at the community center is really one that got me into basketball. And uh, I had really my AAU coach all growing up. Uh, he, he's passed away now, but his name was Larry Griffin. And uh, he was – he was the step like, you know, like you play rec and then you go on the comp like he was my step from rec to comp. And um, he was just an amazing man. And, and one thing I remember is that we had a team of about eight people and we were all kind of the same height. And he was he was probably one of the first people to tell me, like, you're going to be a guard. You know, I was tall as a kid, but he like, you know, you you're not going to be seven foot. So let's work on your guard skills. And all of us were, you know, whoever got the ball, we were bringing it up and kind of playing positionless basketball at the time. And I remember we had practice or games and he would just go through the hood and pick everybody up. Like I would, always, I'm a good kid. So I was always at home, but like we had a couple of kids, like mom was like, Oh yeah, he down the street. He here. And he would just ride through the hood and pick us all up, take us to the game, feed us afterwards and then check us home, man. And I think for a lot of us, especially coming from the environment that we came from man, that kept a lot of us out of trouble and it, it really, um, you know, put a basketball in our hands. And um, so early on, the guy Larry Griffin is, is, uh, someone that I really give credit to, and he, you know, he stayed with me through my my college career and and, and my uh, my professional career until he passed away. And you know, he was a guy that I, I call, you know, call dad. That's what's up, man. That's definitely what's up. You brought up three on three tournaments, so I'm sure you recall like hoop it up. Was that around your yeah. area as well? And, okay. Yep. Yeah, that was. A that was a really big, cool tournament back in the day. I wish they had that again, but you know, kind of like what you just brought up with the story about uh, the guy who who was going around to the hood picking up kids. It's like nowadays you can't really get that no more because times are so different. But you kind of wish mm-hmm. that we can kind of go back to that mode of you can just go by the hood and see someone you want to help them out without without being robbed or you know whatever it is. <laughs> right. Just, yeah. It, it just sad that you can't go back to that time frame where you can just go to the hood and just say hey what's going on you want to hoop somewhere you want to do this without it being a problem yeah yeah i remember like you know the basketball course was always full growing up especially in the summer and you know being from detroit or like st louis or any of these major cities like if you're in the hood like you know stuff is going on but um i always felt like there was like a like a protection it was like no like you know, they, they hooping, like lead them along, like everything is good. And now, like you said, it's, you know, it's hard to kind of go through the hood and kind of help people without feeling um, like something's going to happen or, right. you know, just not being a, a safe situation. So, uh, yeah, I miss those times. That was good times. So when did you have like your growth spurt or did you while you were in school? Because we had certain guys on in the past where they say they, uh freshman year they were like what six one but then sophomore year or junior year they sprout up over the summer to like six eight six nine when did you develop your growth spurt i was always pretty, pretty tall as a kid I, come from, uh, I think my the biggest growth spurt probably between uh sophomore and junior year i got up to six four six five and I kind of stayed that height um, the the rest of my my career, but I was always tall, so I didn't, I didn't really have that big huge uh, growth spurt from in high school. Maybe maybe in uh, elementary or, or middle school, I kind of shot up. That's when you know your mom said like, "Yeah, I remember you was always sleeping and you would wake up and you'd be taller." 
but I'm sure more, mm. most of that was like kind of when I was in middle school and stuff. Mm, yeah, I was uh, <laughs> I was talking with Larry Hughes uh, a few weeks yeah. ago, just seeing him, you know, he's like, what, six, 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 five, six, six. And I was like, man, when I was young, cause I'm like six one. Uh-huh. And I'm like, uh, when I was a little kid, I thought, man, I'm going to be like six, five, six, six. <laughs> and I get to high school, high right. school come. I'm still at like five eleven. I'm like, yeah, ain't gonna happen, y'all. <laughs> <Man. laughs> <It ain't gonna happen. laughs> I'm gonna be just short my whole well, not short, but I guess you know, in regards to uh, compared to compared, six yeah. five and six seven guys, like, oh damn, I almost be stuck being a little point guard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how about yourself, T Bone? I'm pretty sure you probably thought, okay, yeah, I'm about to be a beast mode out, uh, out here. You know, I was always. Like especially in like elementary, I was on the taller end. Uh-huh. Well, I mean, I was I was always middle to taller, but then you know you'd see some kids who were taller and be like, oh well, you know, woo, all right. But then like <laughs> in high school, I mean, I wasn't, I was never short, but I was never tall. Like I, you know, you, you could tell who was more likely to be like the basketball types because I mean right. in high school I was probably like, I probably started my freshman year was probably like. Five ten or something like that, and got up to like six feet. It was like it, it, it just stopped. It, was, it just pretty much stopped around <laughs> sophomore year. I was like, "Yep, yeah, that's that's pretty much where I'm gonna be at." Yeah. So let's talk about in regards to basketball. Everyone has that moment where you realize, you know what, this kid could be special, or you know what, I, I finally found myself. So maybe you say throughout your high school career that you realize, you know what, this is the sport that could take me to the next level and beyond. I, I think my, my goal playing high school was always the, the guy I talked about, Larry Griffin. Like one of the reasons, like, you know, you play play high school and you, your mom ain't got to pay for college. And so that was always my motivation to kind of to get somewhere, get somewhere local, get somewhere small where I didn't have to pay for college. And probably when Mark White came, so my junior year, you know, I, I start to see my game shift and, and be kind of a good player. Then I, it clicked and say, okay, you know, this is my game. I can do this. I see how, you know, I could be, you know, a really good player in college. And I, I never thought NBA or all that stuff. It just never was in my, my thoughts at the time. Of course, you dream about it, but it was never realistic because I'm like, you know, I'm going to Renaissance. Nobody's watching. And uh, that junior year, I had uh, – I had a really good uh, high school season and then I went to like did all the AU stuff. And then I had some good tournaments where I played well and caught a couple of bodies and, you know, went to like the, it was back then it was a Nike all American camp and uh, competed with, with guys like Darius miles. And uh, right. I think Dewan Wagner was there. He was a young fella, but he was there. And um, just all the, the guys from, from across the country were there. And, um, just kind of be able to hold my own and, and and play some good games there. So going back to my senior year, I was like, okay, I can, I can do some stuff. I can really uh, play college basketball. And, and that's when the drive, and I just really started working on my game and um, just in the gym all the time and, and seeing where I could go uh, to play college ball. So when, when you hear Detroit basketball, what does that mean? Man, that's that's special. That means a lot, man. That's uh, just because Detroit is always, you know, it's like St. Louis it's always been like a, a kind of blue collar place, and um, I don't think people. It's not like L.A. or New York where people say the you know the basketball meccas and stuff like that, but it's just like and those teams were just hardworking teams, and uh, they were very unconventional in some ways, and they just found success, and I think especially as a kid watching the bad boys, I was a little bit younger, but when like Rip and, and Chauncey and Big Ben and all those dudes came and they were winning for the city, um, you know, it meant something to everybody because of who you identify with um, guys that have been written off and um, guys that were told they were undersized or they weren't making and they were able to find something, find chemistry and, and find a, a strategy to help, help them win championships. And I think, uh, the city was able to uh, to identify with that, and um, Detroit basketball is just something that you heard all the time. Uh, 
the, the, the announcer at the games, he was, he had a famous radio station um, in the mornings. And so, you know, as a kid, you would always listen to the radio stations going to school. And so, uh, you know, all that stuff tied in. So that, that, that means a lot to me when I hear Detroit basketball. That's hey, what's just, up, man. I just realized that since you would have left Detroit, they have overhauled all of the major sports venues that y'all have had in the, in that time. The, the Silver Dome was gone. Yeah. The Little Screen is gone. The, uh, where, where was it that the Tigers used to play? That's gone. America. Yeah, Tiger uh, Stadium is gone. Yeah. But now, that, but now it's all – it's good, though. It's all downtown, though. Like, it's – you know, the, mm-hmm. the Pistons play like Little Caesars now and, and the Red Wings and – uh, the Lions are downtown and baseball, so they're all like right, right across the street from each other. So it's actually, it's actually kind of cool. Is Kobo still? Is that still there or no? Yeah, it's still there. I don't think they they really use it like that no more. But yeah, it's still there. Hey, what you know about Kobo, I, man? <laughs> I mean, right, well, T-Bone, T-Bone knows some things. Well, see, look, I, right. I, I, you know, y'all, you, you, y'all, are basketball people. I'm a wrestling person, right? So. Okay. You know, I know about back in the day, a long time ago, they used to have Russell and Kobo Hall there all the time. Okay. So, uh, so I know about that. And I look, I told you, most of my, most, some of my closest friends are from Detroit. So I've, I've been to Detroit a few times. So I've, I've driven down okay. downtown, uh, Detroit. I've been to the Motown Museum. I've been to Ford Field. Saw WrestleMania okay. there, uh, back in two thousand seven. So you know, okay. I've, I've been yeah. around. I've, I've been around a few times. That's what's up, man. <laughs> yeah, T-Bone, he is a former professional wrestler. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah. It's like we had a little, little small connection issue with you. But, yeah, as I said before, he's a former okay. professional wrestler. So, yeah, he, he's been around the block a few times doing this thing. Yeah. Yeah. Really? Like, professional wrestler for real? Yeah, I mean, I I didn't How'd you I didn't make that? it's a long story, but uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I mean, you know, for me, you know, see, it's your interview time. I ain't trying to take up too much time, but to no, make it that, short that's for interesting, you, man. I I want to hear that. I never met somebody that was a. I mean, to, to make it short for you, I wrestled all four years in high school, and it was always okay. something I had liked since I was like three years old watching on television. So. Uh, you know, I went to college at Kentucky State University, and when I graduated, came down, had a job, and was like, whew, there's got to be more to life than this. I can't just be doing <laughs> this thing that I don't particularly like. So, you know, I went and right. saw, uh, I don't know if you know the Dudley boys um, from wrestling, but yep. they had a wrestling school that was about 15 minutes away from where I, where I lived at the time. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go for it. Ain't, ain't no better time than the present. Went for it and trained. Wrestled around Florida, Georgia, Kentucky, you know, wrestled in the, the local, you know, shows this around. I got to do some stuff for WWE sporadically, but, you know, uh, luck luck did not work out for me. Had some health issues and basically had to, you know, okay. let it go. Okay. No, that's that's cool, man. I never, like I said, I never met somebody that was a professional wrestler. Yeah, it's uh it's it's not the easiest thing in the world to do but it was fun it was, it was it's 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 fun it's it's some uh you know memories of of doing it i still try to do local shows around here as far as like promoting them you know i'm not gonna okay wrestle anymore but you know i still try to keep it keep it going do what i can to help out younger wrestlers get to okay. you know showcase their skills that's dope man yeah, it is, man. You know, I I just have a, a awesome, you know, panel of guys uh from either the man cave or ladies night who all have dipped and down into something, man, and it's very incredible. So, you know, definitely honored to have T Bone on, and of course to have our special guest Ricky Paulden on as well. So let's talk about after you start realizing that basketball, you know, is your thing, how was the recruitment process for you? Uh, I know your moms and them had 15 million letters and offers and meeting coaches, you know, just kind of give us, if you don't mind, just pulling back a little bit, this what you were going through during that time frame before you decided to choose your college destination. Um, recruitment at the beginning was, was cool. You know, first you get your first letter and, you know, then they start coming in and, you know, everybody's excited about that. But then it was like, okay, like it became overwhelming. It was like, okay, man, like so many schools and so many 
decisions you have to make. And, um, and that's when I, you know, I, I talked to Mark White and, and my family and, you know, then you try to, then you kind of get a plan, like where do you want to go to school? Um, you know, do you want to stay close to home? Do you want to go away? Stuff like that. Um, to me, the most stressful part was, I, it's probably different now, but back then the coaches, they only had a certain time they could call you. And they, I think they can only call you like once a week or something. And so, um, it was stressful because they'd be like, you know, like, hey, such and such gonna call you today. He wants to talk to you or whatever. And they're you're like, man, I don't want to sit in the house and talk to this coach. Like, I want to, I want to do something else. But yeah, I, I'm a nice guy, so I felt pressure. I was like, man, this this guy's gonna take time and call me and try and talk about talk about school. And so it would always be like on the phone, just you know, talking to a college coach. You know, him telling me about his program and and what some of the things he wanted to do. And uh, I just remember all the coaches like finding ways to kind of get around and they were like, well, you know, I'll give you my number and you can call me as many times as you want, but I, you know, I just can't call you or whatever. And uh, my mom being overwhelmed with the phone always ringing. And that was, that was before cell phones and stuff. Mm. Well, I had a cell phone, but it was like the the minute one. It wasn't, it wasn't popping off back then. Oh, look, young um, people don't know about those days. Oh, no, no. <laughs> uh, they don't I just show my age right there. Nights hey, and weekends. They don't, they don't recall <laughs> when you had the one house phone. You got to be like, hey, do not be on the phone between the hours of 8 and 9 o'clock. I don't want to hear that. <laughs> and that's how I was. I was for the coaches. Like, yeah. yeah. I had to tell my sister, like, hey, like, you can't be on the phone. Like, I, you got to get on the phone. Such and such is going to call. Or, um, right. But it was, as a kid, like, not – not really growing up thinking about, hey, this is I'm gonna play the college basketball here. It was it was exciting. It was a good time. It became overwhelming a little bit at times. But once I kind of narrowed my choices down, then it was interesting to kind of talk to people and kind of get their ideas and not their ideas, but kind of see how they they viewed me as a player and kind of how they wanted me to use me in their program and what kind of things that the school offered academically. That was always important to my mom. And uh, just kind of meet the coaches uh, individually as 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 people. You know, you see um, Tom Izzo. I always watch up growing Michigan State and Tom Izzo, and to kind of meet him in person, and see how he is, uh, how his personality is. That was always interesting. And uh, you know, there's a lot of other coaches that you met along the way, and um, so it was it was cool when you saw like the coaches in the gym that you know, we're at these big universities and you watch them on TV and they're coming to watch, watch you play or watch other people play. And um, so that fun, that part was always fun. But the only bad part was the, uh, the beginning where everybody and everybody was trying to send you letters and, and try to get on the phone with you. But it was, it was, it was a fun time. Like I'm definitely thankful for the, the process, for going through that process. And uh, I, you know, I had good memories of it. So, all that process, through all the the stress and the being overwhelmed, and getting all the letters, and telling your sisters, "Don't be on the phone between eight and nine o'clock." Right. What <laughs> What made you decide to choose Mizzou? Uh, so when I narrowed it down, my choice was Ohio State, Michigan State, um, University of Miami, and Mizzou. Um. Miami, I went to visit in Miami and it was Leonard Hamilton was a coach and it was amazing. But I was also, you know, like you, you have the visit and they take you out and stuff. And I'm like, man, like this is Miami. I don't know if I could really mm. get stuff done here. It might be, it might be too much for, for me, for, for me. I'm mm -hmm. a shy dude. So that might have been too much for me. So I, I kind of put Miami out. Um, I wonder what could then, be going down in Miami. <laughs> Hey man, they showed us a good time, and it was, <laughs> it was, it was. I wasn't ready for that yet, so I, I made a, I made a, a business decision and said, Nah. I so, I so wait, so wait, it, so wait, so wait, so wait, so so for those who watched it, okay. So this is the platform sports talk show. This is a a safe space, okay. okay. Did you go through that same experience that Ray Allen did on? Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, he got gay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I didn't. I I didn't get that, man. I was <laughs> I was too shy. 
like it, it definitely was there. Like it was like, you know, you know, they take you to the parties and do all that stuff. But I was I was too shy, man, to kind of to kind of really, really do anything. So uh, I probably missed out on my my Ray Allen moment. <laughs> uh doing it, Jesus shuttles work. Oh, no, it's all good though. Oh well, yes, know, right? please please proceed with, with the process. Okay. So then uh um basically it was Basically, it was Missouri and Michigan State. Um, Missouri had a recruiter, had a – they got an assistant there that – he was at Eastern Michigan at the time. His name was Tony Harvey. And so he would – you know, we'd always go to Eastern Michigan. And he he was kind of one of the first guys to recruit, I say us, me and uh, Arthur Johnson, who was my AAU teammate, one of my good friends. Um, so he was the first one to kind of recruit both of us. But I think he also knew that our talent was a little bit better than Eastern Michigan. And so then when he got to Missouri, then that's really when Missouri got on the map for us. It was like, okay, like, you know, we can go to Mizzou. And then you started, we knew a little bit about the history and the pipeline of Detroit. Like we, you know, we knew Doug Smith. Uh, we knew a lot of the older guys, Al White, you know, uh, we kind of knew those guys growing up. And so like, that was always an interest, but it was Missouri. Like I didn't really hear anything of it. And then the final thing was me and AJ decided that we wanted to go to school together. And Michigan State has Zach Randolph, so AJ couldn't mm -hmm. go there. And then I think we thought about Michigan, but Michigan had a guy named Bernard Robinson, which kind of was the same position as me. So we kind of etched that out. And then Missouri ended up being the – with Tony Hawk in there. Um, and then they had – told us they were going to get Trey Ryan, who was all American at the time, high school All-American, Snoke. So we were four freshmen going in. Um, so that, that was appealing. And then for me, the final, final meeting with coach Q, Quinn Snyder, when he came to my house and, uh, talked to my mom and, and, uh, dude was moving furniture around. Like he, he like moved the coffee table in the living room around and was showing me pivots and showing all these things. This is how we want to do it. And I was like, okay, like, you know, he, he had a passion about it and I felt that. And, um, you know, just the combination of, being able to go to school with AJ, Coach Q, and, and having Tony, uh, Tony Harvey there, that kind of made my, you know, my decision to go to Missouri. And I wanted to get away from home. I wanted to, I wanted to kind of spread my wings and see if I can do this by myself and not be close to home where if something goes bad and I can, I can drive an hour or two and be back home and mama can say it's okay. But now I had to, you know, kind of get away and, and, and see if I can, if I can do it on my own. Mm. So, Coach Q, uh, that was during a time frame when he was just really getting into Mizzou. Is that right? Yeah, he was – I believe we were his first recruiting class. He was there the year right. before, but I believe, like, we were his first, you know, recruiting class. So, it was his second year. So, like, did, so did you feel because he came under, you know, Coach, uh, uh, Coach K – that like the the mentality was man you about to get someone who be who's on the coach K this could really like change the whole program around and we could be that 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 class because we got coach you know Q hold things down like what was that mentality knowing that you had someone who was under coach K a legendary coach in his own right and one of his you know pupils or whomever now is you know spreading his wings at Mizzou and you're being part of that recruiting class. How did that feel mentally for you? That was a great feeling. I think uh, I've always, looking at my career, I've always kind of been at places uh, athletically where um, I was part of something that was built. When you look at my time at Renaissance, like I was part of the beginning that kind of got Renaissance going. And then I wanted to be part of that in Mizzou, kind of be there you know, the research, you know, Norm Stewart had just some really good things there and they had some, uh, they had a lot of successful years. And uh, I kind of wanted to be a part of kind of bringing Mizzou back to, you know, the days when, when Norm was, when Norm was coaching and they were having success. Um, I definitely thought about uh, him, you know, being with Coach K and being part of that Duke program and, you know, all the knowledge he had from that. Uh, he expressed to me that he was, I think before that he was an assistant under Larry Brown with the Clippers. And what really got me though, is he talked, he talked to me about 
the work he did with Grant Hill. And a guy, Grant Hill was another guy in Detroit at that time um, that, you know, we love Grant Hill and like his skill set and how he played the game. And uh, once he said Grant Hill, you know, I was I was in. I was like, okay, you know, make me make me into Grant Hill, make me that kind of player where you know I I can uh, handle the ball and be a smart player and, and kind of get to the basket and, and give me that skill set. So um, those combination of things uh, definitely played a part with me. Like, okay, like you know, I'm gonna go here with Coach Q and, and see if he can develop me into a, to an NBA player. You know, you we have a comment. Hill. I'm sorry, go ahead, T-Bow. I was going to say, you know Grant Hill. You know it's burning into my brain. Grant Hill drinks Sprite. That's Grant Hill drinks Sprite. <laughs> <laughs> That's all it's burning into my brain with him. <laughs> uh, we have a comment from uh, First Name BR on YouTube. says, you was nice. How you and Arthur Johnson didn't get into the McDonald's game. Then that NCAA run in 2002, that was everything. For me, so yeah, how come you and AJ didn't get to the the uh, McDonald's All Star Game? I mean, All American Game. What happened? Man, I don't know. I don't. I don't really know how that works. Um, yeah, I don't. I can't. I wish I had an answer. I, I can't say it was. We were snubbed. Or AJ definitely should have been in there. I feel like I was kind of a late bloomer, where I kind of caught on toward my my uh, senior year. Uh, but AJ was always. He was always Big Arthur putting in work, so um, I'm surprised that he didn't get in there. But you know, I'll, I'll always look back and say it all it all worked out the way it's supposed to. Most definitely, most definitely. So, going to Mizzou, tell us what was the big change from being that guy? Because and this is a very important because you see so many guys like maybe someone who's watching right now who's. Uh, a high school star like yourself, a high school standout that's about to get into that college life. You being the man in high school, now you're about to pretty much start over going to college where you have other guys who are the man at their school or is the man right now in college. Tell us about that transition for you and what you had to go uh, deal with mentally and how you were able to adjust from high school to now college life. I think you made a good point. That that was the one thing. It was like, okay, like I was a man from my high school, but everybody on this team was a man, you know, where they came from. And um, I remember coming in, it's like, okay, you know, maybe I can get in. And, you know, they got Kareem. You know, I might be, I might be a little better than Kareem and then Clarence. And just that first practice, just like, they were so physical. That was that was the, the thing I remember. It's just like I could keep up, I think, athletically, but just like the the physical strength that they had was just something I just I wasn't ready for. Like obviously the game was a lot faster and it's a different pace, but it was, you know, it just felt like it felt like like I was a kid and like as a kid, my my stepdad would take me to go hoop with him and his friends. They were a little bit older. And I had more energy. I can move around. I can get my shot off, but they just kind of knew all the tricks of the trade. Like they could, you know, use their body on me. They knew, you know, how to use my, my youth and my inexperience against me. And that's what that felt like. You know, the first couple of workouts in the summer going against Kareem and going against Clarence. I'm like, who is, who is Clarence Gilbert? Like, who is this dude? And that guy just, he just had the ability to turn it on at a split second. So like, I, he probably like, let me, he probably hustled me a little bit. He let me, think I could do whatever I wanted to do. And then that next practice, he just, he, he turned it up to another level and just, you know, put me in my place and really humbled me. And so um, the biggest adjustment for me was the physicalness of, of college basketball uh, in combination with the speed and just kind of, man, Kareem Russ was a, a bad boy. Like he was an NBA player in college. So it was, you know, yeah, lefty smooth and it was going against him every day in practice. I'm like, man, like I can't, I can't stop this dude. Like what is, what is he on? And then Clarence just, he just was probably one of the most mentally tough people I've ever been around. Just like he could, you know, Michael Jordan, like use anything to motivate him. That was Clarence. And like, he was just like, man, like, like the coach was on one one day and they like gonna make us run. He like, no, nah, they're not gonna break me. So he was he was first in every sprint and, and still dunking and doing all these things. He's just like, they're not gonna break me, they're not gonna break me. And it was, you know, that was his thing. But um, 
once I saw those two guys, I said, okay, uh, I'm not, I got some learning to do. I'm not quite, quite ready for that. And, and fortunately for me, they were really good guys and they kind of took me under their wing and kind of, you know, Kareem showed me a lot and kind of, uh, you know, helped me out. And Clarence was, was there, uh, a guy, St. Louis guy, BG, Brian Garl, that was my, that was like my senior. He, he took care of me and he just, you know, after practice told me, you know, what to do and, and, uh, make sure I was doing doing the right things. And so I, I had a good group in Mizzou that really helped me my freshman year um, not get discouraged and kind of um, kind of get to to be the player that I needed to be. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm very lucky for those guys. But, you know, it was it was it was definitely a humbling experience for me personally. And I'm looking at this roster your freshman year. And I mean, it was Pretty low, like you said, Kareem Rush, Clarence Gilbert, AJ, Brian Grower, uh, Wesley Stokes, uh, Wesley Trayvon Stokes. Bryant. Uh, now T Bone, this next guy I'm about to bring up, he was a uh, he's a former guest on our sports talk show, Johnny. Oh, Parker. yeah, JP, tell us about Johnny Parker, man, and how he was as a teammate because we had him on about maybe two or three times on the show already. He's a uh, you know, for good, uh, good, uh. I want to say friend yet, but uh, you know, we know him very well and he's real cool with us. So tell us about Johnny Parker. Man, JP was just a good dude. Like he's always, he always kept the mood light. You know, he was, uh, he could go, but uh, you know, at the same time it was, you know, he understood like, you know, we had Kareem and, and Clarence and we kind of played through those guys. We had BG, but um, he would, uh, he would show us in practice. <laughs> like it was a couple of times he showed me in practice, like, okay, like, you know, don't let don't let my role on the team fool you. Like, you know, I was that dude in St. Louis. And but he was, you know, mm -hmm. he was another guy that was a big bro to us. Like, you know, we would, you know, we need anything. He came and picked us up. Uh he's dropped us off. Like, you know, we try to go back to Detroit. You know, he he going home to St. Louis. He takes us to the airport, drops us off, you know, picks us up, take us back to school. You know, he was he was one of those dudes, just a good dude, man, and um showed a lot of love. But, you know, we we that senior class, they really looked out for us. And uh, he was he was one of those dudes that um, his family was always, you know, came to Columbia. And so, you know, we were we were over. And uh, yeah, JP was a good dude, man. I got a I got a lot of good memories from JP. I'm also looking at Justin Gage and he was a, a, a superior athlete basketball and football uh -huh. wise. Yep, Gage was that guy that kind of. You know, he came in for football season, just gave us that toughness. You know, he was a guy setting hard screens. He was diving on the floor, grabbing all the rebounds. Um, you know, he was kind of the guy that did all the dirty work for us. And definitely, if you're going to be a successful team, you need a guy like that. And uh, he had no problem, you know, being that guy for us. So I, I see uh, the last person I want to bring out. He has a similar last name to someone who uh, St. Louis people may not like. <laughs> he uh, some got a, a, a affiliation with the Rams. First name uh, is Josh. Yeah. Last name is what's his last name? <laughs> Crocky. <laughs> Josh Crocky, man. <laughs> Josh. Uh, so, so are y'all two still uh, cool at this time, or uh, how is that? Man, I, I talked to him. He's just, he's on another level. He's doing some some big things. So, but he a guy that I keep in touch with. Um, just every now and then we shoot each other a text, and I follow him on social media. But and it's just some success that he's having, you know, professionally with you know. He he on another stratosphere, man. He's he's <laughs> he in a whole other league. So, but Kronk at the yeah. time, man, was was he was a good dude, and uh, I end up. Me and AJ actually end up because he stayed and he registered one year. So my senior year, he was also a senior. I might have registered two years. But like we all all end up living together and you know became close. And um he, he's a really good guy. But yeah, like he um he uh, he has some other stuff right now. And uh but hey, every now and then we, we we shoot some we shoot each other texts and uh you know just to check on each other, see how we're doing. Nice. So someone else who went to Mizzou during the time that you were there, she is the love of my life, my wife, Jamie. Uh, you may recall her by seeing the photo 
But uh, I was told from her that she was uh, a, a huge fan of yours during your time at Mizzou. So the wifey, she uh, says that. all this is my Mizzou days. <laughs> so well, while she was there, she was one of the uh, Tiger hostess during okay. the time of, of of her years at at, at Mizzou. So. She was definitely a huge fan, and she was that inspiration for me to get uh, to get at you and book you for the show. Oh, uh, let me see if I can go get them all. So yeah. you know, so you can you. you can thank her. You know, she get yeah. all, she get all the cool points for right now yeah, for definitely. having you on. Thank you, appreciate it. But yeah, so it, it's awesome just to be able to you know just go back and reminisce over you know certain periods of your life. So I'm glad they're able to do that for you right now on the platform sports talk show. So freshman year, I see that, you know, y'all came in, you know, 20 and 13 for the whole year. And then it looks like each year y'all won 20 games until your senior year. Mm -hmm. But as uh, first name BR brought up, brought up 2002, that year right there, uh, y'all end of the year, ranked top 24. Just tell us what happened from, you know, year one to – uh, the next upcoming years where y'all started getting even more notice and getting that respect nationally. How did it feel being a ranked team and holding things down in Como during that time frame? Man, it, it was a great feeling. Um, I think what happened was, uh, you know, guys like Trayvon, myself, Wesley, we all kind of took the that next step. AJ was lucky because he got the, you know, he got a little bit more playing time than us because he was just, just dominant. You know, he, I think he set like a freshman like block record and rebound and he was just he was just that guy yeah. from the beginning and so he got he got the luxury of having more playing time than us and you know i got some playing time behind kareem and clarence and i think there was one point where kareem got got injured where i got i got some good minutes in there but uh that sophomore year is we had a good summer and you know i think a lot of the seniors had graduated and uh that kind of kind of pushed us into a role. I think Wesley became the starter point guard. And um, I can't remember if I started or not, but I was I was playing a lot of minutes. And I think eventually I got to to where I was starting. But um, but even then, like we we got ranked early and had some success, but uh, we were still a young team. So uh, we didn't we didn't know how to sustain it. And then I think 2002, at the end of the year, we started just playing well and um, just one of those situations. I think we came into a tournament maybe as a an eight seed or something, and maybe eighth or nine, eight or nine, and uh, we just kind of went in with like a, like a chip on our shoulder and and just tried to see what we can do. And for me personally, that was that tournament was kind of like a little bit of a coming out party for me. Um, just playing well on national stage where everybody's watching. Um, that was that was a good tournament for me. I, I got to ask about somebody because now that I'm looking at that roster, I see that there's someone that you played with in college. Smooth would have played with in high school, and I would have known in middle school. Uh, Jimmy McKinney. J Rock. Yeah. That was, that's a little bro right there, man. Like he was, he came my junior year. Yeah. J Rock, man. He, he a good dude. He, I still talk to him a lot, too. Um, I actually played against like we both played in Germany together, so not together, but against each other. Like he was in Germany around the same time I was there, and so it was always good to see him and play against him and uh, um, kind of reminisce about the old days. But yeah, Jimmy, Jimmy was cool. Like he, like I talked about JP, all the St. Louis guys were cool, man. Like uh, Jimmy would always take us down to the city, and uh, he was Jimmy was the man in the city at the time, man. So oh, we yeah. were, you know, we would go places and, you know, they would show us love and, and knew that we was from the zoo. And um, Jimmy always just showed us a good time, man. So, uh, yeah, that's little bro right there. Man, I'm looking and I don't know what happened in my life to have me look older, or, you know, as old, because you're actually uh, you're a year younger than I am. Uh, but I have like all this gray hair and everything. I don't see no gray on you, man. I don't know what you've been using if you have or not. Have you just been working now so the gray don't come? But I don't know what I have, what I've have done or have not done. But uh, Lord, uh, man, I, but, I just can't. I can't grow a beard. I ain't got no facial hair. Like I had this like since college. This is all like <laughs> this is all I get, man. So I think that has a lot to do with it. I just I want a beard. Okay. 
Um, but I, I just, I can't get it, man. So, uh, I think if I had a beard, I'd have some gray in it too, but this is, this is all I got. Now, now something that we do have in the comment is because, uh, when I was in school, I, I had the waves going, it was busting, I had man. a little texturized curl going and, and I know you had it too. There man. we go. Boom. There he is. <laughs> little Ricky doing his thing, flexing <laughs> and everything. But the way so I was there and everything, and now, you know, we're we're both you know bald head guys, uh. But just just seeing these photos, uh, just what comes into your mind? Just seeing you know a couple of these moments that you had during your career. Man, that's great. The, actually, the one on the on the right when I had the orange jersey on that guy guarding me. That's my guy Jesse King. He also from Detroit. Him and AJ went to school uh-huh. together, and so like, you know, that was another guy we'd always see. When we played A and M, so that was some good memories. Um, and then, I mean, I'm just looking at the hair, man. Like I try to tell my kids, like I used to have hair back in the day, and <laughs> you got that, was, right that was the hardest thing for me, I think, with as far as getting older, is like like losing my hair. You know, I was like, man, I could wear like the Kobe fro, and I can get the waves, and now it's just I'm just bald, man. I just just shave it off. <laughs> it looks bad when it's growing back, and. Right, right, right. <laughs> and, and like, and like for me, I usually wait like maybe three days after I shave my head to shave again because I, like you said, I don't want to have that island showing. Oh you man, know, look like five years old. No, uh, yeah. I, I got to keep the, the, the diving in the back oh. and the, the sunroof, man. <laughs> right, right now, uh, 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 got time in for that. <laughs> I gotta go ahead and keep it, keep it clean, shaving over here in these parts. Mm-hmm. You know, we got an image to, uh, you know, to rep. Right. Uh, let's see here. Oh, and uh, Miss Williams says, love hearing the life experiences of players like Ricky Paulden. So there we go. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's what this show is all about, man. It's just about getting that experience in. So uh, first name, you kind of brought up a little bit. I mean, you talked about the excitement of playing in the tournament in 2002. But uh, first name, BR, what was that 2002 tournament like? What was the locker room like game by game? So, like, for instance, just tell us that moment when y'all watching CBS, watching the selection show, that excitement that you had when y'all heard Mizzou's name come up. Man, I, re- I remember that. Like, we were sitting uh, sitting watching together, and it was a situation where, like I said, like, early on in the season, I think we were ranked pretty high, and then we kind of lost some games in the middle. And so it was, like – we didn't know where we we're gonna be, where we we're gonna be called, if we we're gonna be called at all, and so it was kind of like, kind of some uneasiness, but also like, like we get in there, we ready, and so when we saw we saw our name being called, and that was kind of like a, I don't know, like a second season for us, or kind of like okay, like this is our time, we can um, really do some do some damage, and you know, at the time I didn't realize, you know what it meant to be an eighth or ninth seat and like the, the path that you, that you get to, to play on and stuff. And so uh, I don't know, it was just one of the moments where everything kind of clicked and we kind of found our stride and, you know, one game, it was this guy playing well and next game was another guy. And it was um, everybody kind of brought in. And I, I remember just one play. It was, I think we were at Albuquerque and uh, it was a loose ball and Justin Gage did have a chance they have no chance of getting that ball, but he took off and dove on the floor and um, and just bust his bust his tail to try to get the ball. And um, I think Coach Q always showed us that clip, and and that was that was kind of the energy we had, and that he was kind of like our emotional leader, and and him doing that just brought us so much energy, and uh, wasn't a guy that scored a lot of points for us, but did those things, and that play was was something I remember. Um, and that just showed what kind of team we had, you know, what kind of guys we had in the locker room. Everybody was pretty, um, pretty selfless. And, uh, we knew, we knew Kareem and Clarence were our guys and big AJ inside. And, um, I could contribute a little bit in Trayvon and, uh, we kind of knew our roles and it, it worked well. And we had a, we had a really good run. Two part question. Uh, of course the new Missouri arena, is incredible. I'm pretty sure you've been there a few times. Uh, it's an amazing atmosphere. But it was something about the Hearn Center. And when I say this to previous guests that we had or, you know, on previous shows, 
how it felt like the fans were right on top of mm-hmm. you. And I thought that was just like an awesome atmosphere. So from your experience, tell us about the Hearn Center playing there during that time frame. And then what was your best uh, road game that you love to uh, to be in, road uh, arena that you love to play at or, or you know, just experience? Right. Uh, yeah, the Hearns was uh, – people still talk about the Hearns. Like, man, like, you know, I remember the days you guys being in the Hearns. And like you said, it just felt like we were – everybody was on top of each other. Even if you were all the way up in the stands, like, you still – you still were right there. And that was – that was an amazing feeling, especially when we had some success and we were we were playing well to have a sold out Hearns Arena. That was a big advantage for us. And that was um, that's one of the things I, I still remember. Like I remember like like just playing overseas. And uh, I think the team I played for the arena was like six thousand people. And they were like, well, how's it feel to play against to play in front of six thousand people? I'm like, man, in college, like it was, you know, the gym was rocking. So, you know, this is nothing to me. I'm used I'm used to that. But uh I think everybody that, that that experienced Mizzou basketball and the Hearns has the same same feeling. Like it was it was just a special place, and um, you're right. It just felt like everybody was on was on top of you. And uh, but Mizzou Arena, it's you know the way that they get, those guys are playing now. Um, I've been to a couple games now, and uh, you know it's a, it's a great atmosphere too. And as far as like the road team, of course KU. Playing at Allen Fieldhouse was always mm. it was fun because those 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 fans are crazy and it was such a big rivalry and that gym is super small and you talk about people being on top of you like that was I don't think it gets any smaller than that that and you know Cam and indoor but uh, definitely playing at Allen Fieldhouse was probably one of the probably one of the the best you know away team atmospheres that you can that I've experienced in my career. And I'm glad you brought it up about Cam because I think y'all was the last Mizzou team to actually play at Duke. Is that correct? No, we, we played them in the tournament, so I don't think we actually really really played there. Okay. It sounded like it was – okay, but maybe it was a tournament. I thought it was a team that actually went mm-hmm. to play at Duke. Maybe it was a tournament, so my yeah, apologies on that. Okay. So what would you just say overall – uh, would be your biggest takeaway of your experience at Mizzou? Um, overall, like, like for me, Mizzou was just a great place to go to college. Um, as you, academically, it was really good. Um, athletically, especially with basketball, it was, you know, some of the best basketball I played in my career. And, uh, you know, I was, you know, thinking about my career, I was, you know, some of the decisions I made was always because I just love my experience at Mizzou and being a college student there. And, uh, you know, probably to, <laughs> to my detriment, as far as getting an MBA, I probably, you know, there was some years where I could have left and um, probably ended the draft, but I just love being a student at Mizzou. I love, you know, what we had as a team, you know, as far as basketball, and I love, you know, being, you know, being on campus and just going to school there. So I have great memories of Mizzou. Um, I, you know, we raised our kids to be Mizzou fans and uh, we take them back when we can. And uh, I go back to Columbia whenever I can. My wife went to Mizzou. And so, uh, you know, it's just, it's just a special place. And I'm, I'm very happy with the decision I made to, to go to Columbia and, and uh, attend the University of Missouri. So now you had the high school stage, college basketball stage. Talk to us about the draft process before uh, getting drafted by the Pistons, 54th overall of all teams, <laughs> the Pistons. Right. Just tell us that process and what you had to go through, you know, going to different gyms or doing different uh, scheduled activities with certain teams, you know, for the draft. How was that process and how was that feeling of you getting drafted? Now, we know that 54th wasn't like the top lottery, you know, range, but you still got drafted. Yeah. So about that process and how it made you feel when you got that uh, that call. Man, it was it was a great feeling. Like I, I was at home uh, with all my family and uh, I couldn't I was so nervous. I couldn't watch it. So I was like everybody was in the house. 
And I think I was just like in the backyard outside, just kind of chilling and talking to people. Just I was just so nervous. I couldn't sit there and watch it. And so uh, I remember my family coming out and telling me that I got drafted by the Pistons and everybody was excited. And then, you know, my phone rang, of course, and you get the call from, uh, I think, I think it was uh, John Hammonds, who was, interestingly enough, he was an assistant at Mizzou uh, the year before I got there. So I had met him, but then they left and he kind of went to the NBA. So John Hammonds uh, was the guy who drafted me and I kind of talked to him and uh, that was just, that was an amazing feeling. Just for me, I say I was happy that I was drafted, but just for my family to have that experience and like the people in Detroit that watched me grow up and watched me play basketball, that's something they still talk about. Uh, it's like, oh, I don't know why the Pistons didn't keep you or whatever. It's like, eh, whatever. Like it's, it's something I can look back on and be proud of. And just going through that process was amazing. Like uh, you have, you're in these workouts with all the guys, especially college guys that, you compete with like you know i played against every i remember every workout i was with a guy tony allen who had a great nba career but he went to oklahoma state right and me and tony right. allen were always in the same workouts like man like can you not match up on me like because tony tony is an intense dude like so he he 100 percent all the time and i'm like yo like i'm trying to look good i'm trying to show myself in the workouts could you not you know and he was competitive like could you not like guard me man like go do something else but like we always joked about it and uh yeah so it was just like you get to meet those guys that you compete you compete with and then it's they're not your enemy anymore like we're all mutual peers going through the same thing we're talking about you know what workouts you're gonna have next and who's your agent and you know where they think about where you're thinking about you'll get drafted and stuff like that so that that part of it was fun to kind of make friends you know, with those guys and we're all young, kind of going through the same process. Um, it was fun to, to be in a lot of those NBA facilities and, and meet some of the, uh, some of the people that are involved with the teams. Like I remember, you know, going to the Bulls and seeing uh, John Paxson and BJ Armstrong. BJ Armstrong was a Detroit guy and, you know, he was in the NBA. So we all idolized uh, BJ Armstrong and just meeting him. And uh, I had a workout in Boston and so just Boston is just a special place and just being in Boston, I mean, I was a practice facility, so it wasn't anything big, but just it was the Boston Celtics and just a lot of those franchises just watching, watching those things on TV and kind of being around it and, and seeing that that was, that was something fun. And like you said, okay, yes, I got grad drafted in the, in the second round. And it wasn't lottery, but you know, just to be drafted at all was was a was a big thing, and um, I'm very proud of that moment. And uh, it just made it extra special that I got drafted by the Pistons. And uh, yeah, it was it was a fun time, and um, I'm I'm definitely thankful for that experience. And T Bone, real quick, uh, as he was bringing up his challenges facing, you know, guys like uh, uh, who you say Tony, what's his last name again? Tony Allen. Uh, Tony, Tony Allen. Allen. Uh, T-Bone, was there someone during your college years that you uh, – or a school that you were like, oh, yeah, I got this person on, on my radar. When this this day come up, I, I got him. I mean, not in, not in college. I mean, with Bam? I mean, not really. Well, uh, I, 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 I'm sorry. I, I'm referring to, like, wrestling, too. Oh, well, once we got to, like, wrestling training, like – um. At Team 3D, like, you know, when you – the main thing we would always do at the beginning of every day would be, like, drills and stuff that we'd have to do. And, you know, just to – quick background, like, the guy that used to do our, um, our like, training and stuff, like getting us in shape, is the guy that created the American Gladiators. His name is Dan Carr. So, okay. uh, <laughs> so he would have us doing all kinds of stuff that you – wouldn't expect to see, but you know, we'd be, you know, doing stuff with tires and one day he'd have us doing box jumps and stuff with, it, it, it was a lot of stuff, but anyway, <laughs> it would get to the point where, you know, you'd have, um, you'd always start to get competitive with different guys. So like, you know, they're like, I can tell you, like we do like planks and stuff, but like he mm -hmm. would have us challenging to see who could do a, a, a plank the longest and like, 
Me? Not something I particularly cared about. So I I do that plank for my <laughs> two or three minutes. But like one of my friends, I think he held a plank for like twelve minutes or something like that. Um, Man. you know there was there was always challenges, and you'd always want to try to be the best because especially like then you would think like, okay, look, if I if I'm the best, if I'm the most athletic, if if I'm the most in shape, you know that'll help them want to push us to you know give us shots because you know at the time mm-hmm. like. They were working for a company, so you you want to try to figure out the best way that you can get an inroad into the company. So, you know, it was it was always that type of thing back then. You always want to try to do something that you can to get a better advantage over the people. But that was, you know, you we we quickly learned that none of that none of that mattered. We just needed to be in shape so we could do what we needed to do. Yeah. Mm. And I see that you were part of the draft with uh, Dwight Howard, Andre Iguodala, Luol, Luol Dane. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you you had some guys, some ballers, man, with you, man. That, that was an impressive class right there. Uh, was, was that Jameer Nelson? Yeah, it was a good class. Yeah, nice, nice little class there, man. So, did you get a um, – did you have any kind of relationship with other uh, guys in the draft during that time frame? Um. You kind of meet those guys, like I said, during the workouts. Uh, uh, I met Javier Nelson a couple of times just because we were both seniors. And so they had like, you know, a couple of senior like award shows and something. We kind of saw each other. And, uh, <laughs> my mom was actually a Jameer Nelson fan just from watching college basketball. And then she saw him and I think she like took a picture with him. You know, it's like, mom, you can't take a picture with him. <laughs> right, right. But it's right. like, you know, it's like she was so happy to see him. <laughs> Yeah. So like Jameer Nelson and um man, I think Delonte West was in that class. Like he was, you yes, know, he was. That, yep. that was pretty good. And um, you know, all those guys, like you saw them around, you know, and then once we all got drafted, we were, you know, you do all the NBA like photo shoots and do all these things, and so we get to talk talk to each other. And a lot of the, the lottery kids are like, you know, yo, what kind of car you got? And like, nine. Hmm. I ain't on that yet. I'm a, I was the second round. So I'm like, I'm a, got to make the team first, man. But, that was a, so. Was tell us the magic, though. Oh, right, right, T ball. So uh, tell us, tell us about your <laughs> tell us about your experience just being in the NBA. It was very brief, <laughs> uh, but just. It's just like it was just like my my freshman year in college. Like it's just a whole nother level. Like just um, early on, um, I had a pretty good summer league for the Pistons, and like so then it's another thing. Like okay, I'm going in. Like you know, I'm a rookie, and they got they just won a championship, and it's the team. Everybody's coming back, but you know, I'm a I'm gonna show myself that I'm showing that you know they can use me or whatever, and just uh, watching Tayshawn Prince work out and uh, Rip Hamilton. It was just like a whole nother level, man. It just, just seeing somebody like, like that was, that was their profession. Like that was, that's what they do. That's what they did. So it was like they just, right. just so good at it. And just seeing guys like not miss shots and, and you know, Rasheed just, you know, shooting the fadeaway and always just making it and just them just getting the reps and reps. And what what shocked me was I didn't realize how much time those guys spent in the gym. You know, like, mm. you know, in college, you show up, you might show up an hour before, shoot. But depending on the day, if I had something to do after practice, I was out, you know. And I, they encouraged me to shoot. Like, I would say, okay, I'm going to get my work in before, and then I'm out. You know, I got class, I got a party to go to. But, it, like, NBA, like, that was their job. So, you know, guys were in there, you know, a couple hours before practice, getting treatment, lifting weights, um, getting shots up in practice. And then kind of doing the same thing afterwards. And that was that was a that was a big realization for me. Like, okay, like, you know, this legit is kind of like a nine to five. Like they they put in their eight hours in and they're not just showing at the gym hooping, you know, get some shops up and leaving. And so that was that was my impression of NBA that it was just like, no, like this is this is their job. This is what they do. And there's a reason why they won a championship. There's a reason why this guy's an all-star. This guy is you know, the player he is because, you know, he, he puts in the time. And so um, I've had a lot of good experience in meeting players that I've, I've watched growing up um, and just seeing, seeing the lifestyle that they, that they lived and um, 
met some some good people, some guys that were rookies at the time when I was at when I was also a rookie. Um, it was a great experience, uh, one I wish I could have had more of. But you know, I'm, I'm thankful, you know, for all the time that I got. And uh, yeah, that was, you know, that was my big impression of it. And then for you to have uh, during that time frame, Larry Brown as the coach, correct? Yeah, Larry Brown. It was funny, like he didn't like I was I had all my summer workouts and I didn't see him like once. Like it was like, okay, like coach, once you do this, and I was like, but you know, coach don't play rookies, right? And so like, well, why am I doing all this stuff? He's not gonna play me. But um, even like the sisters, mm. man, they were they were cool. They were good dudes, and they just really you know did a lot to prepare me. And um, yeah, Coach Brown was he was Coach Brown. Like he was. Uh, very smart guy. Uh, knew a lot about the game. Um, you know, at the time, just you know, he was he won a championship, and you know, he was. I don't know, like it, I didn't have a lot of interaction with him because I was a rookie. But at the same time, like it, it, you know, it was it was good for him to. It was good for me to be around him and see how he how a Hall of Fame, you know, coach, you know, interacts. Got a comment here from Art Johnson says, R. Hey. P. My God, what up, though? <laughs> That's what's up. So, is that the AJ all the Johnson from the zoo? Yeah, yeah. That's what's <laughs> up, big man. Okay, shouts out to you. It's an honor to have you uh, commenting and watching the, the sports talk show right now. We definitely appreciate it. Gotta hopefully have you on and have your story told as well, AJ. But yeah, man, uh, his yeah, his you gotta, game. You gotta have Doc on, man. <laughs> hey, hey, AJ, hit us up, man. Just this uh, tag us on uh, Facebook or whatever. Let's make that happen. But uh, yeah, because his game, like you said before, in college, um, being you, you see him, you think about blocks and rebounds, and 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 how he made that that little jumper every now and then, or, or the baby yeah. hook. Uh, he had that that solid post game. He was definitely a big factor during that time at Mizzou. So definitely shouts out to you, all the Johnson. He's uh laughing with the emojis right now. So that's what's up. Just showing you love and everything. Uh, Miss yeah. Williams, I'm sorry, says I think a lot of us underestimate the effort it takes to be a pro athlete. I think so. I think that's true. I think until you see it, well, I, well maybe now I think kids have more. <laughs> access to it with social media and all that stuff and you but you know at the time i didn't i didn't know you hear about it and you, you know it's one of those things you don't really realize it until you until you see it and it's like man like you know this this is a like i said it's legit nine to five or however many hours you put in the gym it's it ain't you're not just showing up to gym hooping and going home and collecting a check like it's guys are really serious about their craft Right, and then it's kind of like how oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, T Bone. You go first. Uh, I was just going to ask a quick question because you know these are things that we don't really think about, you know, on these different levels. But like from your experience, what's the different levels? Like, what's the the differences in the levels of uh, the training staff between going from high school to college to once you're in the NBA? Like, what does that look like for people who don't know? I oh, mean, for me, high school it was it was non-existent. Like we didn't. <laughs> Uh, we didn't have a training staff really like we, uh, you know, our, our coach was, he was the coach. He was a, the strength coach. He was a physical therapist. He was a trainer. He was, he was all of that. Um, and then high school, I mean, in college, then you see like, okay, like it's, you know, it's, they're taking care of you. You know, you go get treatment. Um, you have a strength coach and you're working on your body and what you eat. And, uh, and then the NBA, it's like, college times 10 where you got so many people you know at your disposal that it's like you know there's really no excuse to not <laughs> not be in shape or um you know because you have everything at your disposal and injuries you can't control but um anything you want to work on you know in the nba you have that at your disposal and i think college is probably it's been a long time since i've been in college but you know i, I can imagine that you know, time to change now where you probably have even more people, more trainers, more nutritionists and things like that at your disposal too. That's what's up. And then going back, like you said before about these professional athletes, 
they make it a living to work out eight hours, 10 hours a day, maybe even more. It's kind of like how an NFL coach or just a coach in period, they go in to the office five in the morning and leaving out till nine at night. You know, mm-hmm. I know it's very similar to professional athletes. Like you said, they making shots almost every shot they putting up is <laughs> a bucket because they it's work bucket, on yeah. it all the time. So it's just great to have someone like yourself to be able to give us that behind the scenes because people just think, it, oh, I'm going to just get there and just do my thing and go home and yeah. just grab a nah. beer, um, you know, PlayStation or whatever. But no, your living is to make buckets or to do what's best, you know what I'm saying, on right. the course so you can feed, feed your family. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? People don't realize that until you get into that moment and it's like, whoa, I had no idea. So like, yeah, for instance, for instance, when you hear these stories about about Kyler Murray from the Arizona Cardinals, where you hear about him being a gamer, you know, how does it make you feel when you're hearing that a starting quarterback is more <laughs> known for being a gamer than, you know, I'm saying working on plays and leading his team? Man, I mean, I don't, I won't speak too much of it because I don't, I'm not in the locker room and I don't know the situation, but it just, I mean, it's kind of discouraging that because he's an amazing talent and um, he showed that he can, can be a really good quarterback in the league. And um, I guess part of it, a lot of it is probably youth, you know, just, um, you know, when you're an amazing athlete and you can, and things come easy to you, you might feel like, okay, like I don't, I can get away with not, um, you know, knowing the playbook or watching scout videos and, and kind of being on top of myself, I can kind of show up and kind of, you know, improvise and, and you get away with it. And, you know, maybe that's, that's been the case for him, but um, I think now it's kind of, it's kind of biting him on the butt and uh, you know, with the, you know, new coach and a new system um, I think he's really going to be held accountable. And so I, I, you know, he's a a guy that I want to see succeed and hopefully, you know, something clicks and he um, has the right people in his corner and tell him that he, you know, he probably could, could do more and, um, you know, maybe game a little bit later when after he's put his work in. But um, a lot of respect for that dude. He's an amazing athlete, and um, hopefully he can add a little bit more work ethic to you know to his talent, and, and you know he can definitely be one of the one of the top tier quarterbacks in the league. Most definitely. So, real quick before we continue on, this is the platform sports talk show. Your Wednesday night sports delight. In the next two minutes or so, for those listening on Hot 365 Radio, the stream will be cut off very soon. Uh, Normally, we'll be in like around 930, but this conversation had just been so incredible. And I just had so much to just want to, uh, you know, unpeel while we have uh, the great Ricky Paulding on. So for those listening, once again, on Hot 365 Radio, the stream will be ending at 930. So please go on your devices, on your TV, go to YouTube, go to Facebook, go to Twitter, or twitch.tv slash hot365radio and enjoy seeing three brothers, three good-looking brothers on your screen talking some sports and and life. We won't be on too much longer, but we just want to definitely continue to uh, peel back some more layers from your wonderful career as we have Ricky Paulding as our special guest. And thanks to T-Bone as well for still being on as well. He's on the East Coast time uh, right now in Orlando. Oh, so it's like, it's like almost midnight out there for him. Yeah. But he's home. <laughs> so I appreciate y'all. And once again, this has been an incredible interview uh, so far. So uh, Ms. Williams had a question earlier. I want to make sure I go ahead and bring this up. So she asked, so did your time – with the Pistons help prepare you to play in Germany? I think it did when the same standpoint where I said, like, it's, you know, I, I approached it as a job. Like I wasn't just playing basketball for fun anymore. Like it was, it was a job. And at the time, um, you know, I just got married when I went to Germany, I just got married and I had a kid on the way. So it was like, I was, I was being an adult. So I had to like, it wasn't, I wasn't just playing for myself. I had to, um, you know, provide a good life for, for the family that I was, that I was building. So um, in that respect, it, it prepared me for Germany, but you know, it's a, 
I guess overseas basketball is a lot different than, than the NBA. And so uh, basketball wise, it didn't just because it's just such a different game, especially at that time, almost, almost 20 years ago. Um, yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a different game. So uh, it just, it really prepared me for, you know, just approaching the game and, and being a professional athlete. So, as I brought up earlier, got high school, going to college, college to NBA. Now, I know you said earlier, a short stint in the NBA, but now you talk about a whole nother shock, culture shock, and that's mm-hmm. playing professionally. So just tell us about that transition from being in America all your life to now going overseas and not knowing, you know, a language fluently and just overall that experience uh, playing overseas and, and professionally. And it was it was crazy. Like our, my first job after the NBA was uh, in Israel, in Jerusalem. So, mm. you know, at that time it was in Tel Aviv, you know, the it was just the stuff we saw on, on the news. So it was, you know, it had some car bombings. There were some some sketchy stuff going on in Israel. So my family was like, yo, like, why are you, why are you going over there? But, you know, I talked to an agent, I talked to, had a chance to talk to some people that played there. And it was like, it's not, yes, obviously there's some, some things going on. Um, but Jerusalem was a pretty, pretty safe place. And so, you know, I, I made the decision to go there and, you know, everything is Hebrew. So it's not even, it's not even the same letters. So you can't read anything. Right. Um, so that was a big culture shock for me. Uh, I granted it was a big enough city where uh, a lot of people spoke English. Um, there were a lot of, there were a few Americans there. So that, that was a, a plus, but it was, it's, it's different, man. It's, it was definitely different. And, um, you know, just things like, when I went to the mall, you know, you pull up in the parking lot, security standing there with a big, you know, machine gun and mm. they search your car. They got a mirror they check, make sure there's no bombs under there. They check your trunk as you open the glove box. This is, this is every time. So you have to get in the parking lot. Then you go into the mall, you still got to go through a metal detector. You get patted down and then you go in the mall and everything's cool. But that was like, it was like yellow light. It's a lot to go. And that was everywhere. That was to go get something to eat. If it was a big restaurant, you had to do that. Malls, any, you got to go to the bank. Like you, that was like the regular procedure. And so it kind of became normal. But, you know, at the time it was, a, it was, that was a huge deal, the thing to deal with, especially being um, young and, and had never, I've been to Europe, but I had never been overseas. I had never been to Israel. And, uh, that was a big culture shock for me. So that was, but at the same time it was Israel and it was Tel Aviv and, you know, nice weather. And uh, at the time Israel was a very, like, I think we played, when did we play? Maybe we play like Sunday or something because uh, Friday and Saturday you had, it was like a religious holiday, so you couldn't do anything. So it was, I had a lot of free time. I had a lot of time to explore and just enjoy the weather. Um, Israel, is a league where there's a lot of Americans. And so we would all, you know, meet up in Tel Aviv somewhere where we're getting something to eat or we're out hanging out, you know, so you get to, you kind of build that community where we kind of get to know each other and get to hang out. So um, definitely a lot of culture shock things from our first year, but also a lot of positives that, you know, I'm glad that um, playing for, playing in Jerusalem was my first year because I, it was a, it was a good experience. Then I see that you went from France, I'm sorry, from uh, Jerusalem to France and then eventually ended up in Germany. I mean, so you definitely are a world traveler. Yeah. Um, yeah, like next year was was France. I was in Lyon, which was a really nice city. Uh, French people are a little different. They, especially at that time, they, they didn't speak a lot of English. So uh, my wife at the time, not my wife at the time, at the time, my wife was with Uh-oh. me. Uh-oh, wait a minute. 
Dude, she's still my <laughs> wife. But at the time, my wife was with me in France. And, uh, you know, she took French in high school. And so, like, she was, you know, she was getting us around. She was uh, kind of the, the translator and kind of helping me, you know, help us figure out things. So that was that was a good time for us to just kind of uh, just be on our own. And, you know, we didn't have any kids at the time just kind of be our own and kind of navigate this new situation together and uh, kind of grow as a couple. And uh, we had some really good experiences and uh, yeah, we were in Lyon and then next I went from Lyon, which is a big city to like a really small city uh, on the North sea. And it was just like a little village, but it was, you know, everybody came to watch basketball. So the town was, was around basketball, but it wasn't a lot to do in our downtime. But, and, you know, that's those situations, you know, you become closer to your teammates because there's nothing to do. So, you know, you're hanging out, eat dinner together, uh, going to the movies and doing certain things. And so uh, you develop some some connections and some friendships that, you know, my some of my teammates that were on that team in, in France are still my good friends now. And, you know, we have kids now and they're all older and we kind of talk about those things. So, um yeah, that was that was also a good experience. Um, you know, just being young and you know being my wife, my wife and I being together and 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 not having kids at the time, and just being able to, like I said, navigate that that journey together. So yeah, shouts out to your wife and just for real quick, how big was it for you mentally? for you to have that support, that backbone from your wife during that time overseas? Man, that was that was huge. Uh, I was going to say earlier when when uh, Doc, AJ was on, when he commented, like, I don't think people realize how, like, him going to Mizzou with me was a, was a huge, huge thing because that was like, that was like my, my brother, man. So it was like he was, like I said, I'm shy. So it was like, okay, like, I know whatever's was going to happen. I got AJ with me that he gonna protect me. You know, that's my my guy. He gonna he gonna stick up for me. So he, you know, a lot of time he was he was the mouth for me when I, you know, when I needed, you know, people trying to take advantage of me or something like that. Like you know, he always stepped up and was like a big brother to me. So that was you know, it was cool to have a guy like that with me uh, the four years at Mizzou. And this, you know, same thing for my wife, man. My, it was. I've always been, you know, a guy that's close to family and, and, and like just having people around and for my wife to um, to kind of drop everything and, and kind of move overseas with me was was a huge deal. Um, she's, I guess, a little bit by her. She's she's older than me. So when I met my wife, uh, she was in law school at Mizzou. And so she graduated. And then my senior year, she was actually working for a firm in Kansas City, did that for a couple of years and then. When I went overseas, I was just like, "Hey, you know, you want to, <laughs> you want to go overseas with me or whatever, and see how it is." So, she went to visit, and everything was cool, and uh, her family thought she was crazy for dropping everything mm. and come, come, mm. come be with me. But um, she did it, and um, we're still together. And so that that was, you know, that was that was big because they're, I'm, I'm showing my age, but there was no. There was no Netflix and all that stuff. So it was right. You know, you right. was grinding. Like you we had DVDs and stuff, but uh there was no Blockbuster. Yeah, <laughs> like you had to go find a movie, even a movie theater, like maybe you got an English movie or maybe you know you had to watch a French movie with subtitles. So it was a, a lot of us just kind of navigating and kind of figuring things out on our own. Um and so I, I say those years kind of shaped us as a couple because we got to know each other a lot. And there was a lot of time where we're together and she's like, you know, why don't you go for a walk or something? I'm tired of seeing you, you know, those things. But, <laughs> oh. you know, the situations that make us, you know, so now we're able right. to say, hey, man, you're getting on my nerves. You know, get on my face or something like that. And and not take it personal. But you right, know, having right. my wife was that was that was huge for me. And T Bone, I know that you know we do having to always travel, you know, every week. You having that backbone from your wife as well has to be pretty amazing as well, right? 
Yeah, you know, just uh, knowing knowing in one direction, I got someone to go back to, or exactly. So I've been uh, for the past what couple months now. I've been going back and forth from uh, St. Louis to Orlando once a week and coming back a couple of days later. So, yeah, I, uh, I I I look forward to to going back home in uh, tomorrow. So yeah, okay. That's dope, man. So to the ladies that love us with everything they have, we appreciate you. We never, we, we will not forget. We will always remember everything that you've done for us and we'll continue to do so because, you know, we, without y'all, we can't do what we do and do it with the passion that we have. So we definitely, thank you. Uh, thank you from the bottom of, of our hearts. And so let's talk about this moment because you, we brought up earlier about you know, having her uh, doing our younger years, right? You know, had uh, the waves busting, you know, had the curls popping, you know, look, <laughs> like, right here. Yeah. But then you brought you brought up a certain moment, and I, I saw this picture, so I had to go ahead and uh, expose you, man. Because uh, what happened right here? No, oh no, man! No, no. Oh. Yeah, that was that was like you know you still you still trying to hold on. Like I remember. Showing like her pictures from the game, where it's like, oh man, like there's. I was like, well, maybe that was the light. It was the way the light was shining on my head. That was a bad angle. And then it was like, nah, dog, like it's it's gone, man. Like it's it's gone for real. So, and then overseas, man, it's you you thugging it. Like it's I they didn't have a barbershop there, so I was you know my wife was in the kitchen cutting my hair for me. So it was you like, man, whatever. I'm just. I'm just out here. I'm hooping. Nobody's seeing me. I'm married, so you know, I ain't got nobody to impress. Right, 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 right. exactly. <laughs> but hey, that was that I mean, was. I was still. I was still holding on. <laughs> I, I had that on. same exact stage. <laughs> it was a photo that uh, I took when I was in Chicago. This is like this is over 20 years ago now, whatever. But. I thought I was like, 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 like doing my thing, looking good. So I'm, yeah. I'm out in the sun, right? I had the <laughs> drop going. I took a photo doing this. I'm like, I'm like this, like you know, look at me, hey, you know, right. whatever. <laughs> I look at the photo, right? I mean, my line was crisp. You know, I, I had the hair going back here, but right here, mm. I saw like this big old ball spot on the photo, and I'm like. It's time to go ahead and shave it off. <laughs> it's time to go ahead and shave it off. Cause I thought I was I was cool with it. Like, okay, I, I got the look. I'm right. I'm, I'm crisp with the lining. Now the hair was like, uh, uh-uh, uh, partner. Yeah. It, 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 it it's a wrap, and I had to go ahead and shave it off. As soon as I saw that photo, I had to go ahead and shave it off. Like, yep, it's a wrap. It's time to go bald. Yep, I, I had to do it, man. Don't and worry. So I'm now right, I'm right there with y'all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm looking. I'm looking here. I'm like, dang! I got the Stephen A. Smith kind of going here. So <laughs> the white says, I, say, I'm man, <laughs> "I always say, I, I wish I would just had the. I would have took the Stephen A. I could. I would have. I would have rocked that a little bit longer. But hey. when, it's, when it's missing in the front and the back, I can't. You can't, you can't do, do it. About that. You gotta nah, go ahead. Nah. Yeah, as, long as, I, as long as I keep it low, I'm okay. But I, I've always had a big forehead anyway. So as long as I keep it low, it's it's you know it's it's not as noticeable. When you when it starts yeah. to grow a little bit, it's like man, I got that Stephen A. going. <laughs> Shouts out to the wifey and Ms. Williams. They appreciate the ball man. So I'm talking about you know hey you know what I'm saying. <laughs> you know. But you know I see some more photos here. You got this moment here, clean shaven. Yeah, with your teammate, describe this photo if you can recall this moment. That was so um, overseas. They have like in this in during the season they have like tournaments. It'd be like an NCAA tournament, but they have it mid season. And so that was that was a road game where we won, and that's one of my big fellas there. I played with him for like five years, and he was just a guy like I talked about JP Johnny Parker earlier. He just kept the, mm-hmm. the mood light, man. And uh, he actually, so he's, I played with a lot of uh, people from ex Yugoslavia, so Croatia, Serbia, uh, Slovenia. And uh, 
you know, those those big men like you see with Jokic, man, they can do everything. And this guy right. was he could, you know, anytime I cut, he would the ball was coming or, you know, he's out there, you know, directing and telling us what to do. And he's just like a was one of my favorite teammates to play with. And I think, you know, we're just having a moment. Just we had just won a game. And um, I think I always told him, like, man, I'm too old for this. Like, I, I think for like three years straight, I'm like, man, I'm too old. I need to retire. Like, I, I don't have it no more. And I think I had a pretty good game there. And um, so we're just just kind of talking after the game and and having a good feeling. Good time right there. Yeah, and I have another good action shot right here. Like you about to go to the hole. Uh, yeah, that was in the playoffs uh, against a team called Alba Berlin, who is, you know, one of, definitely one of the best teams in in Germany. They're, you know, won a championship multiple times, really historic, historic club. And uh, it was just one of those teams where, for us, we just couldn't, you know, it's a five-game series, so – you know, you know, we win a couple games. I think this series we took it to to game five, but it's just one of those teams where, you know, they make a sub. It's like, okay, we got them, and they make a sub, and they just keep coming. They just keep coming. It's like, man, like, you know, we don't have enough firepower to compete with them. And, uh, you know, just kind of going out and, and competing and doing your best, but uh, definitely a team that was, you know, when, when a team is better than you, you just – you know, you go out and compete and see what happens. And at the end of the game, they beat us. You know, they were they were supposed to win because they were the better team. So uh, a couple of comments here. So Miss Williams says that her son, my boy, I, I, who I've known since we were little kids, uh, a friend of mine, Ed, decided to shave his head a couple of years ago. It's a good look for him. And Ed, yeah. I mean, he had some he had some hair. I mean, he had the fro uh -huh. out here. He, he kind of like Quest Love, you know, the drummer from uh, – yeah. Roots. Yeah, from the roots. I mean, yeah, he had the, the fro and everything, and now he's bald here like me, like us, and you uh -huh. know, the best look of his life when he turned bald head. Uh, then the wife he <laughs> wants to take it back to Mizzou. She asks, Do you recall Chanel having uh having you get uh my wife at, well, of course at the time she was in college out the dorm and had a surprise birthday party for her Yo. when she got back to I do remember that. That's crazy. <laughs> Yo, that's that's crazy. Man, yeah, taking it back. That brought back some taking memories, back. man. Oh, I do remember that. Wow. That's what's up. And then Ms. Williams says that she noticed that Eastern European players have great ball skills. Like you said, Jokic and, uh, I mean, just, just Dirk. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah. I think Dirk was like uh, the, uh, the, the, the transsetter. You know what I'm saying for the European. No, well, I'll take it back. You got Tony Kukoc back in the day. Yeah, you got a lot of those. Uh, yeah, actually, some players. You know, Drazen Petrovic. Yeah, like Tony Kukoc and those guys. That's like Eastern Europe or like actually, those are like basketball countries. Like you know, Croatia, Serbia, even like Lithuania. Those are like countries where they just like yes, they have soccer. Like in your Europe, Western Europe, soccer is like king. So like in Germany, soccer is big. France, soccer is big. But like in those Eastern European countries, most of the time basketball is is king. And those guys live, eat, sleep, dream basketball. And um, those are some of the, the 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 best teams to play. And those players, they're really good. They're really good at basketball. And uh, it's weird. Like you kind of you kind of know what certain countries are known for basketball wise. When the more you play. And, um, Eastern European countries are, are pretty good. And just going back to this photo real quick, I see the crowd. How would you rate or or compare the crowds that you see overseas and the energy compared to like the NBA crowd? Do you feel like it's more energy with um, overseas crowds compared to the NBA crowds? Definitely. I would say like the overseas, it's like it's like a playoff game every every game. Like, you know, mm -hmm. NBA, like during the playoffs, crowds get they get pretty rowdy. So it's but like that arena where Alba Berlin plays in, that's like a it's like an NBA size arena. So it's mm -hmm. um, so it was it was packed. It was jumping and that was during the playoffs. So it was 
but I would say like overseas is it's more kind of like your college atmosphere where it's you know maybe sometimes maybe you get a smaller venue but it's it's crowded and and overseas is weird because they'll be like they'll be soccer fans but they just go because that they had they like the soccer club and they have a basketball team so they're just going to support the club so people don't even know anything about basketball but they're just there because they like the club and they're there to support and it's it's That's it, it get rowdy like in like greece and some of those they get they get nasty they they call you out your name and throwing stuff at you and they roll like flares and i've had guys like in greece on the bench, there's like a big like thing over you. Like, you know, you have the bus stop and it's like that that shelter. It's like one of those over right, the bench right. because fans are like, they throw That's stuff crazy. at you. If, you. if you win it, then they throw in stuff at you and they wait for you outside the bus and stuff like that, man. So it's, I've definitely had some man. interesting experiences there. Hmm. That is that is crazy. So now that you're, uh, I'll bring it up again, high school to college, college to a little bit of NBA, then NBA to playing overseas. Now that you have retired, uh, what are you doing now? <laughs> I always say, I'm trying to figure it out, man. Like I said earlier, man, it's just an adjustment from having basketball rule your life and just kind of tell you where to be. And uh, all the things that at the end of my career, I was like, man, I'm, I'm tired of being told to be a practice or I have to do this or, or, take this 10 hour bus ride to, to go play this game and then come back and being away from my family. Uh, but now it's, I'm figuring out I've, I've got a 15 year old freshman son and I got another son that's 12 in the sixth grade and my daughter's nine. And so the, the younger two actually started coaching basketball teams for them. This is our first, our first year we play kind of in the winter, taking a break now, pick it back up, you know, in the spring and summer, but, um, so this is my first like forte at kind of like coaching. And I always thought, man, I don't want to coach. Like it's, it's a lot of time and energy and just, I just don't want to do it. But it's also hard to be a competitive guy and kind of throw your babies out to other people. And it's like, man, like you shouldn't be doing that. You should do it like this. And so like, I just say, okay, I'm a, I'm a coach them. And uh, it's been interesting. They, uh, they still see me as dad. And not coach, so it's a lot like my daughter, man. She gets mad at me like every game and every practice. I'm like, what's wrong? Like, what did I do? And it's just like she just won't talk to me for like 30 minutes. And then like my son, I'm my wife told me I gotta take a step back because it's like I'm always not on him in a bad way, but I'm just like, oh man, like you could do it this way, this way. And I'm like, his name is Sid. So I'm like, Sid, Sydney, like do this, come here, come here. And she's like, I luckily I have a guy that coaches with me, so he's like, okay, like. Let me talk to Sid sometimes because, you know, he still sees you as, as dad and it's, you know, coming across, you know, he's, he's getting, he's taking it the wrong way where maybe I can, you know, have a different approach. So right now I'm, I got, uh, and like years before in the summers where I was home, I always did a basketball camp because that was important to me. Um, growing up, I always went to basketball camps and, um, you know, and just getting to, to, to have to interact with whoever was hosting the, the camp was always big to see, okay, this guy kind of we're at what, no matter what level he did high school, college, whatever, he did something that I wanted to do. And so now I, I kind of want to, you know, inspire kids to, if you want to play basketball, great. If you just want to be active and, and, and get moving, that's also great. So I've done camps the last five years in the summer and now in the winter, I'm kind of taking it to, you know, I've started a fourth grade team and a, a sixth grade team. And I kind of just want to see how that goes and maybe build the program up and get some more coaches around. And so I'm still involved with the game of basketball. Just uh, right now I'm coaching and, and, and seeing how that goes. How involved are you still with Mizzou? And what are your thoughts on the team this year and what Dennis Gates have done to has done for uh, this team in just a short amount of time since he got hired? Oh, man, I've, I've been – whenever I've had an opportunity, I've been down. So I think I've been to about four or five games this year. And actually, this is this is my first time being able to watch Mizzou live. 
like because I've always been in season. So I've so since I left college, I've never seen Mizzou play like live in the arena. So this is my first year after having an opportunity to, to do that. So we went to some games early. We went to the KU game, which was amazing. Um, went to outcome. <laughs> uh, outcome wasn't, but just to have that rivalry back and and have a sold out arena right. at the Mizzou had been so so good in the last couple of years. But man, Dennis Gates is, I think he's doing an amazing job. And and just um, you can kind of see his vision of how he wants, how he wants to play. And you know, me watching him on the sideline, he never seemed to get uh too flustered or or beside himself. He's always got a, a pretty cool, calm demeanor. Um, you know, one of the things I like is he's reaching out to a lot of of the old players and just saying, Hey, like I want you guys back. You know, I've been on a zoom call with him and, and guys that played in different eras. And he's just, you know, telling us his vision and um, just telling us to come back and be a part of the program. Cause he, he appreciates, um, you know, the program wouldn't be what it was if it wasn't for, you know, you know, us and, and the guys that were before us and, and all the things that Norm Stewart did. And so that's, you know, that's the main thing I like about, you know, Dennis Case and what he's doing with the program. Yeah, and to have that team right on the cusp, I know outside of last night's game against Auburn, but to have that team right on the cusp of being top 25 going to turn the time very soon. Uh, yeah. Shouts out to him. He definitely has made a difference in that team, and that's what good coaches do. They bring mm-hmm. a different culture. A different mindset mentality and uh it's gonna look even better and better as the years go by hopefully we keep him at mizzou for as long as we can yeah I hope so too, man. right because you know how it is you get hot you, you make a, a difference then the hot shot school wants to get at you and give you that money so hopefully mizzou does the right thing and make sure that he stays there because as long as he's there he's gonna make a difference and he's gonna change some lives and he's gonna keep that culture going at mizzou for sure. Yeah, definitely going to do that, man. So this has been, once again, an incredible interview on the Platform Sports Talk Show. Ricky, any special shout-outs? Uh, no, nah, man, I just I appreciate you you guys having me on here, man. This was this was fun, man. And uh, like I said earlier, man, sorry. You know, we were, you know, it was hard to find a date, but I really wanted to make sure that, you know, I was able to do this. And uh, I appreciate everybody that watched and, and all the questions and um, appreciate your wife bringing back that, that memory, man, from school. That was, that was cool. <laughs> um, man, it was a pleasure to meet you guys. T-Ball, man, that was, I, I would love to, to chat more about uh, your wrestling days and, and kind of how you got into that. There's, you know, it's very interesting to me. So, um, but yeah, man, that was, it was it was a good conversation. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. And you know, that's that's definitely what this show is about. As we know, we always stress is as long as we you know get someone like yourself booked and get their stories told and and uh you just feel like you know, you just want to be able to let stuff out that maybe you couldn't have back then. And that's what this show is all about. It's just to get what other people may not realize what a person goes through in life, you know, from you going to from uh, going from the United States to overseas and mm-hmm. going to that different time of adjusting to a different culture and different language and having your wife there with you in that support system. And people thought, oh, well, she tripping leaving, uh, saying, uh, leaving the, yeah. the United States to go overseas. But right. you are proof that, you know, when you have a belief and, and you stay prayed up, which I'm sure you did, uh, you know, through the bombings and all that, that was, that could have went on while you was there. Mm-hmm here now so it's definitely been a pleasure uh t-bone i'm sure you got to go ahead and start packing up if you haven't already <laughs> and, and and get ready to you know hit the uh hit the friendly skies tomorrow so thank you for your time and i'll, I'll see you for um man cave next week all right yeah i'm uh again you know glad to glad to be a part listen listen to good stories and listen to you know other people's experiences you know, I'm always I'm always glad to hear, you know, other people's stories. It, it's just, you know, makes you makes you just think like, man, you know, everybody's got a story to tell. And we glad we get a chance to uh, 
to to have them tell their stories on here. So I'm glad to hear your story, Ricky. Oh, no problem, man. So Ricky, if you don't mind, just uh just stay on. We're gonna do a quick you and I will do a quick little uh post show talk. If you don't mind. Okay. All right, T Bone, you have a good one, bro. All right. All right, y'all, it's the Platform Sports Talk Show. Once again, I'm your boy Smooth. Real quick, before we end the show this weekend, NBA All-Star Weekend goes down. Once again, this will be the first year ever that you will have the All-Star Draft going down right before the All-Star Game. So not on on Friday night or Thursday night and then leading up to the All-Star Weekend. Right before the game, they're going to have the all-star draft go down. It's going to be like back in the old school days when you were uh, at, at the basketball court, like Rick, you were talking about in the days, you know, uh, on the highways playing or off the highway playing or whatever, pick up games, and everyone line up and you picking teams. That's how it's going to be for the all-star weekend. And on your screen now, you have Team LeBron, Team Giannis, so the guys that's, that has the star, they are the starters. And, of course, as they've been doing the past couple of years, whoever wins the coin toss will have the first pick, and it'll go back and forth until the last person is picked. They must choose the guys that have the stars next to the names first before going to the reserves. The guys that have the circles like Steph Curry, Zion Williamson, uh, they would not be playing, of course, because of injuries. But it should be – or actually, let me move this last uh, this bar here so you can see my wife's favorite player, Kevin Durant. He's not playing either. So, But once again, the guys with the stars, they are the starters, so they have to be picked first before everybody else gets chosen. So Team LeBron has not lost since this has been started over the last couple of years since Kobe Bryant's death. LeBron has kept things going. We'll see how it goes this weekend in Utah. Let me know in the comments your excitement about the All-Star Weekend. Uh, And, of course, we have up next, we have the three-point shootout contest that goes down on Saturday night. St. Louis is on. Jason Tatum is in it. Uh, Kevin Herter, Tyler Hero, Tyrese Halliburton, Buddy Hill, Dame. Dame time, Lillard, Anthony uh, Simmons, and Lori Markkinen from the Utah Jazz. So that should be exciting. Who do y'all have winning the three-point contest? Leave a comment. Let me know. The dunk contest. Now, this is going to be very interesting. Not a lot of well-known names, so let's hope for a good competition. But the biggest takeaway is Mac McClung. He is the first person to be chosen to choose, to be in the dunk contest from the G League. Now, he just got brought up and signed a two-way contract with the 76ers, so he will be representing the 76ers now. But during the time that he was voted on to be part of the Slam competition, he was in the G League. And this kid here, he has bunnies. When I say he has been well-traveled in regards to or well-known over the last couple of years since his high school years to his time at Georgetown, and a couple of years playing with the Lakers, I believe. Uh, he didn't play a whole lot of time, but he did get a little bit of time. But this dude here, Matt McClung, is someone that you want to check out in the dunk contest. And uh, I, I won't be surprised if he shocks the world and wins this weekend. Then lastly, you have the skills channel, uh, challenge. Excuse me. Last year, I believe it was the Antetokounmpo's who won the challenge. You have Giannis, the Nassis, and Alex. Then you'll have three guys from the Utah Jazz, Jordan Clarkson, Colin Sexton, and Walker Kessler. Then you have the rookies representing with uh, Ben Caro, Jabari Smith, and Jaden Ivey, whose mother is Noel Ivey, went to St. Louis, then, of course, went to Notre, Notre Dame and doing her thing right now as the coach at Notre Dame. So All-Star Weekend is here this weekend. Check it out. It's going to be amazing. Shouts out to Candace Parker. She will be, for the first time ever, the first woman to be an analyst doing an NBA All-Star game. So 
amazing time doing an amazing month for black history shout out to you candace parker do your thing for everyone else thank you once again for watching an incredible incredible episode of the platform sports talk show shout out to joe bo shout out to bunny she couldn't be on the night taking care of business but shout out to you as well bunny to t-bone once again thank you very much and to our special guests ricky paulding letting his story be told on the platform sports talk show it's been a privilege i am your boy smooth get ready next week for the man cave as t-bone will be hosting the show so look forward to that the man cave goes down next week it's going to be official everyone get ready for more special times on the platform sports talk show your boy smooth and we are out Hey.